can take away the anger and the fear. Oh, now can make the hate and racist disappear. Feel a man who's walking down the street in red hell blow. Feel a man who's lying on the curb he'll never know. See the children fight, see babies ask their mama's life. See the women work so hard to keep their sons alive. One love, I got to have ya. One love, I got to want ya. One love, I got to need you now. One love is all we need to make it work somehow. One love can change the world. We've got to see it now. One love, I got to want ya. Thank you so, so much. That was beautiful. That was really, really good. You have an amazing voice. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you thank for you. having me. Thank you. Um, Zori, the last performance for today is by Master. Yes. Maliki yes. and Zori is going to be the one in Hello. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Maria and Sara, for this opportunity. My name is Zore Rezazadeh. I am the president of UNESCO Body and Mind Wellness. We have the same office with Mr. Gijoken in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, I am so honored that uh, could bring some of the Iranian artists, even though there are so many issues, as you know, uh, Mr. Mehdad Malaki or Master Malaki, because he does so many great programs and he is a good master having different classes. In these two last days, he is supposed to have a film shooting and also some recording. For that reason, he apologized, but he wanted I convey his message about uh, love and peace. After when we are surviving this pandemic, hopefully we are able uh, to cherish that togetherness and the joy that comes through music and art. For that reason, uh, thank you so much again, everybody. And I hope that the contribution of Iran and his uh, art can help that peace. Thank you, Zori. Thank you. Thank you, Zori. Mariana, please play the video. Yes, I'm ready.
That was fantastic. Wow. Wow. Really I, good. I wow. just wanted to <laughs> let you know that um, his instrument of Master Maliki is uh, Qanun. And this is a instrument, musical instrument that is very ancient and generally is used for the Sufi music and dance. And the message, mm. it was a part of uh, love and peace. That's something that has to come from within. Uh, it was very spontaneous and they use it in Iran and all the Mediterranean and the Middle East countries as a way to you know, join the greater being in our life. It was amazing. Anyway, Thank if you, you so would much. like that to contact really him, good. you can write uh, to yes. him directly. Okay. Yes, Thank and that you. was really good. Thank you so much. So Thank we've you. come to the end of the culture and music show. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And thank you to all the performers and artists of the day. You guys were all really good and amazing. Um, so, Rodrigo. Okay. Uh, one moment, please. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Heather. She's going to use only one hour of that time. So we have some flexibilities here. Uh, some of the some of the performance that we're doing live, if they're online, you know, we can give them each one minute. Oh, to say I think something. they're online. Yeah, I yeah. Think those who are online. these those who are in mm -hmm. direct, we can give each one of them an image. Today is Sunday, so. <laughs> and then yeah. uh, her, uh, she told me that she's uh, she she doesn't need the two hours. So, and given that uh, we didn't get a chance to, you know. We just enjoy the music. If any yeah. of the performer that's here, uh, we can give them a minute, especially those who didn't get a chance to say something. If they are willing to say something, uh, that would be great. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah, you Dana, know them very well, so yeah. you can yeah. connect with them. And uh... Deborah, are you still here? Yes. Yes, I am still here. Yeah, yeah, if you would like to say something. Yes. Um, well, I've been uh, wanting to connect with groups like this for a long time. So um, if you could please let us all know how to stay in touch and, um, you know, things that we can also relate to people on our social media to bring attention to your groups or, or, you know, whatever it is that you need to support your group. I would love to know about anything like that that I can share with my followers also. Please tell us a little bit about you. Uh, oh, do, please, oh. a little bit about you also. Thank you. <laughs> Definitely. The invitation is there. Once you pass any other event, you are part of the family. So that is oh, a given. So you. tell us, let us know a little bit about you and, and what makes you move, you know, what keeps you waking up in the morning, please. Uh, thank you. Good question. I'm an ambivert, so I'm schizophrenic every morning. I want to be out helping people, being of service, but my gift is my music, my voice, my writing. So, which puts me, I need to be in the public eye. So it's a very difficult thing for me because I am very shy. Um, and I have a radio show and I'm, I'm also socially active, politically socially active. So I try to push things out, express myself in ways that bring information to other people about things that are going on that they're not aware of. We all assume Everybody knows everything that's going on in the world or in our countries or whatever. And so I read very voraciously and uh, keep in touch with a lot of things. And so I'm an information channel, I guess you could say, but I'm also an instructor. I love teaching. I love students. I've been a martial arts instructor and a music instructor wow. for 40 <laughs> plus years um, and <laughs> from California to New York and uh, that's basically what I do and who I am. And where are you currently? What city are you right now? I'm in Rochester, New York. Okay, not too far. We are in Maryland near to Washington, D.C., so yeah. Ah, very nice. Very That's where nice. our headquarters is, so. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is a wonderful thing today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sarah, since has, Sarah has your contact, uh, and again, even the rest of this program, feel free to tune in. We have an am amazing speakers and things like that, uh, so it would be good to so they'll be sharing the information with you. And again, this is uh, the beginning of a collaboration. And uh, like I say, we are now part of our family. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I also have an FM radio show here in Rochester, New York. So if you ever have anything that, you know, needs getting out to the people of the world, it's online as well. Uh, just perfect. call me. You have an interview anytime. Oh, okay, perfect. We, we'll, we'll sure make that happen. Even uh, it may also be, uh, I see some of... Uh, 
the laureate because we have competition all the time. Some of them we, we may connect with with you. So yeah. yeah, we also have a film festival that's going to be on the thirtieth uh, or the thirtieth. I think as uh, one or one p.m. If I'm, we'll send you the information. Okay. Beautiful. Yes. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you again. Peace have you. a good Sunday. Yeah. Peace. Yes. Anyway, Thank you. I love the I love the love on your t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I had to. I'm a messenger. <laughs> okay. Great. 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 Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay. Sarah, the next one. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um. Do Dana, please. Are you still here? I don't think she is. Okay. The next one. Mm -hmm. Um. The group from Rwanda. I think we would like to know more because we don't have anybody from Rwanda. I hope they're still here. Yeah, if they're there, that'd be great too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. No. Nah. Okay, okay, from Romania, Alumnus Club from Romania. So she can tell us more about the theater act and everything. I think many people are interested in it since we want to go online to also watch it. I will text her right now and see if she can come online. Okay. Anyway, so uh, and basically while we are waiting for that, uh, this is another great opportunity uh, for me, one of, first of all, to thank all of you for the performance. And again, uh, the rationale, be uh, our mission is to help raise a new generation of peacemakers that are going to strive to make the culture of peace a commodity of everyday life through education, science, culture, and communication. And this is exactly what we do. So, and any one of you joining is actually help us. And we like to say in UNESCO network, UNESCO, UNESCO club network is to our mission, help raise, uh, plan the peace of, um, plan the seed of peace in the mind of people. So that's why when we have, we are lucky to have all to around 500 young people uh, from around the world that have participated in this program, it's a great opportunity for us to really plant those seeds of peace in their mind, okay? And uh, another thing that uh, for mm -hmm. those who are joining here for the first time, there's a buzz going around here, uh, is that there's something that's going to be unveiled very soon called Peace Land. Peace Land. And I'm saying that because uh, we are going to be unveiling it uh, the next couple of days by the, uh, the the program, especially at the, at the closing ceremony, you hope to invite all the performers to be to join us uh, for the closing ceremony. Sarah, make sure you you send them the invitation because there will sure. also be some some performances also then, and we need to sure. you know to bring everybody together on the last day. You sure, you I'm have someone it. else? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, Georgiana from Romania. She's okay. here. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Again. Good. So we had a few a minute also to again for some people to know more about you and um, and personally well, I've, I've been I've been working with uh, the Romania a lot because uh, the president of the e uh, Europe and North American Federation UNESCO Club Saint Association is the president of the Romanian Federation and uh, we work with a very good <laughs> collaboration. Okay. Uh, do you want to, to say something about me? I mean me, not my project. Me about me. <laughs> Go ahead, what please. I'm doing now, or I don't know what, what to say. What? No, basically, uh, we just want our viewers, our delegate to know about uh, what personal you are doing and maybe a little bit more about um, some. And because I know you have a, you remember you have the youth your youth museum mm -hmm. that we, your federation used to have. You can talk about that a little bit. So there's uh, the, the. No, youth I'm museum. working. No, no, no. I'm no, I'm not uh, working. In oh, you're not the project. Okay, no. yeah, just. So tell us Just, about you. Mm. Yes, I'm working in theater. Like right now, I'm doing a project of um, summer fest in Constanza theater mm. festival. If you're coming to Romania, please come to us. The dates, <laughs> give us the shows. dates and what is all about the festival. About theater, it's uh, we um, we'll have uh, more than twenty theater from all Romania mm. this summer. We just started. Uh, it's okay. The people are uh, respecting uh, distance and yeah, okay. uh, wearing distance. masks and, you know, all the stuff. So it's safe. Mm -hmm. It's difficult because uh, we we have great production and people do their, the, I don't know, uh, want, want to 
go inside and we can't we can't do this because you know the rules. And um, right now I'm um, preparing for my um, um, PhD on this autumn. I would like to um, to do something in marketing research, marketing cultural, of course, and write something. <laughs> Uh, and it's great to be here. I I didn't know how it will be, and I, I I'm really now I'm very nervous because <laughs> I'm no no nervous. I mean uh, emotional. I'm okay, very, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, maybe next time I'll be more uh, I don't know <laughs> calm down and open, and I will tell more about my projects and and. Anyway, it's nice to, to meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the uh, dances were great, and you are great, and you're very warm, and it's all I need <laughs> for tonight. Okay. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very, very much. much. So this is a very good transition. Uh, I think, uh, Sarah, anybody else? If not, we can transit. That's good, right? No, I don't think there's anybody else. Okay, perfect. Available, yeah. So the great thing is that we are... Uh, we are finishing, you know, uh, with some with uh, news from Romania. And Heather, who is the next speaker, uh, knows a lot about Romania because she's mm -hmm. actually uh, uh, has uh, something, you know, some project that I've gone to in uh, in Romania for the longest time, and I've been part of that program. So this is a very good transition mm -hmm. here. So, uh, who is the young person uh, ready to uh, introduce her? She's going to have one hour, so around 12.30. Yes. We are going to reconvene around that time, and then I'm going to take the, the microphone again after she's done. She can take a few minutes extra if need, but whatever, when she's done, I'll be taking over. So, uh, who's the student? Rodrigo, uh, Rodrigo I'm turning over yes. to you. Maho, Maria Jose. Maria Jose, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, please. Okay, so um, our speaker is Heather Caton Anderson who is an advocate and speaker instructor with published works in the field of education with multiple awards. She serves as the president of the nonprofit organization World Genesis Foundation for the last 10 years, dedicated and committed to the mission of the United Nations Educational Scientific and Cultural Organization, focusing on bringing educational programs to the youth. World Genesis Foundation was founded in 1999 with a mission and whose mission is to leave no child without hope for the future and has been named one of the top top nonprofits for the last six years. In 2013, he, Heather aided in the, in the launch of the U.S. Federation Club Centers and Association and was elected to serve as a secretary general for said organization. She has been an organizer and participated in multiple projects worldwide including leading the worldwide UNESCO Youth Club, a multimedia competition that started in 2014. Great introduction, thank you. First, I wanna just check my audio. Am I coming through okay? Yes. Yeah, you can hear me and- Perfectly, and yes, yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you for having me here. Um, I wasn't even expecting that introduction, how nice. And. Um, and I do want to say to uh, Georgiana, um, what a wonderful uh, program that you have in the theater. And uh, Guy was correct. Yes, actually, right now, it, I would normally be in your part of the world with one of our biggest youth programs. So it was great to have and hear you on. Uh, in addition to that, um, I also wanted to mention uh, that um, there was another woman on here from Rochester, New York. And so I just wanted to say uh, I'm also from uh, that part of the world. So it's amazing how we're connecting uh, on this platform. So my name is Heather Anderson, and yeah, I'm the president of World Genesis Foundation. Our focus is bringing youth programs and opportunities to youth around the globe. Uh, Guy and I have been working together for um, about six years, maybe a little bit over. And uh, one of our passion projects uh, that we uh, started to develop, but we're in our sixth year, is the uh, U.S. FUCA uh, UNESCO Club Multimedia Competition for Youth. And it's amazing to see some of our winners on the platform here because I've been working with your names and projects for months and only seeing your picture. 
So it's been great to connect. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to say, um, if everyone can hear me okay, <clears throat> I have a film for us to watch. It's about eight minutes. I think somebody's un unmuted. And, um, and, a, and a PowerPoint presentation for us to uh, look at. But one of the themes uh, that somebody had mentioned in the chat was we are one. And I love the idea of this theme because I feel like there's so much more that connects us um, that we find when we start making these social connections. And for now, our social connections are for the most part through like Zoom and online. But um, in general, this has been my uh, finding and just listening to everybody here, I feel like you guys are already ahead of the game being able to come to this platform to the IMUN and connect with each other as you are and have been um, uh, on, on the Zoom chat here. So, uh, when we watch this film, I want us to think about examples of maybe when you have broken outside of your social comfort zone. So what do I mean by this? Uh, it could be simply, hey, this is my first Zoom call and I'm really super shy and you know, for the opportunity to introduce myself and talk about myself or my experiences to, you know, what do we have here? You know, close to 100 people is really outside of my social comfort. Maybe it's connecting with somebody on this platform that now you have um, a friend that now you can connect with outside of the IMUN. Or maybe it's something different in your own country where you um, really went out at a limb and, and did socially... Uh, introduce yourself to somebody or shared a story. So I want you to be thinking about that because I hope that we can connect and talk with each other and you can share some of your stories after our film. So just be patient with me for one second while I'm hoping to get this up. Uh, okay, here, I'm gonna go to share screen. Here and here. And hopefully this will be working. Let me go here. Okay, is everyone seeing that? Okay, I'm not hearing. Okay, hopefully you'll be able to hear it as well. Yeah, we were able to hear it. Yes, people matter and interacting with those people Positively, genuinely, and creatively should be normal and not abnormal. And I believe that the way to transform that lofty, abstract philosophy into a concrete reality is to challenge ourselves and other people to take positive social risks. I want to share a story that I feel like helps break down what it is to take a positive social risk and gives you a picture of that transformation. But to organize some of the chaos that goes on up here, um, I want to divide the space into a couple sections. First chunk, we're going to call our own interpersonal comfort zone. So this is where we're comfortable. The outcomes of our social interactions are certain. Life is both predictable and familiar in this space. Over here, this pile of boxes, we're going to let represent our own anxious bump. So the further we get from our comfort zone and the closer we get to our anxious bump, life becomes more uncertain, more unpredictable, more unfamiliar, and more uncomfortable. And all of those unwords pile up to form a barrier that separates and isolates us from other people. Comfort zone, anxious bump. So rewind to a few weeks ago. I'm hopping on a bus on my way to Boston to pick up my grandma from the airport. And as the bus route's moving, I'm struck at how silent this crowded bus is. And so I'm thinking to myself, if there is any place to test whether a positive social risk can transform the way that you experience the world, this is the place. So I start looking around to, for a person who I can connect with genuinely. And the more that I look around, the closer I get to here until my heart rate is about right here. And I look down to the person next to me. And I say, hey, what's the Jason project on your hat all about? And he looks up confused. 
And then his face lights up and he starts giving me all this information about what the Jason Project is. Now he worked with Robert Ballard, the dude who discovered the Titanic and all this passion starts flinging out. And in that moment, I realized that all the unpredictability and the uncertainty and the discomfort and the anxiety that I brought with me into that interaction was gone. And I was certain that that conversation with Henry freaking rocked. <laughs> but the skeptic in me, as I was thinking about that, was saying, Real, does every positive social risk that I take really end up in this miraculous, great conversation with Henry's on grim bus rides? Nope. Have I said some things to people that have ended in mildly awkward situations? Yep. <laughs> Just the other day, I was walking down the street with a friend, and I saw a girl across the street wearing the same color lime green jacket as I was. And so with the wholly positive intention of connecting with another human being, I looked at her and said, hey, love the lime green jacket. It's a great color on us. And I got shut down hard. <laughs> got shut down hard with a, oh, and a beautifully arched eye roll. <laughs> when I was thinking, though, about what actually happened, that was a failed positive social risk. But what actually happened, and besides a dent to my ego that was magnified by the fact that she was a fourth grader, <laughs> Nothing happened. Nothing happened. She kept walking and I kept walking and our days went on. And that's when I realized that taking a positive social risk is not about whether you fail or you succeed. Taking positive social risk is about stretching yourself outside of your comfort zone over your own anxious bump, wherever that might be, so that over here you can begin to see people as people with depth and stories, feelings, fears, and aspirations, and not as objects that move around, get in your way, or vehicles that serve your purposes. And when you begin to see people as real people, the barrier that separates and isolates us from other people begins to disappear. So I'm standing up here blabbing on about stretching yourself interpersonally and taking positive social risks and disrupting your pattern of social interaction. And so I want to follow my own darn advice. So the pattern of the interaction that we are having right now is that I get up and say some words and then you clap. I want to shatter that right now. I want absolutely none of you to clap. But I invite all of you to stand with me. Stand with me. And in a minute, when I say the word connect, I want you to turn to a person next to you that you do not know and have never met. Look into their eyes, introduce yourself, and share a piece of who you are. Share what you are most passionate about in life right now. Listen deeply to each other. And again, let your applause be the sounds of your voices connecting in here and out there. Don't clap. Connect. Okay, I want to make sure I'm back and my volume is here. Let's see, make sure my audio settings are good. Okay, can you hear me okay? Okay, one moment. Okay, I'm not hearing anyone through, so one moment, I think I need to do this and that. And, oh. Can hear you loud and clear. Now we're back. Okay, I needed to play with the volume and get that back. Okay, wonderful. Okay, we're back. Uh, 
Okay, here's where I'm going to ask everyone here to uh, share a story that you might have. I, I love that film. Uh, I love that he shared his moments of how anxious he was because sometimes it's nerve wracking to um, go outside of your social comfort zone and uh, and try a new experience. Sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're not. So, okay, who's on board that has a story to share? First of all, you have to tell me your name and where you're, you're where you're from, maybe something that you're passionate about right now, and tell us a story of maybe when you've gone outside of your social comfort zone. Who wants to go first? I think you can unmute yourself if I'm correct, yeah? Uh, let's see. I have Roddy Rodriguez. I'm just seeing if anybody... If you do, you guys have the ability to unmute yourself? Yes, they have it. Oh, okay, wonderful. Okay, if you good. would like to, to participate, please raise your hand on Zoom or just open your microphone. Or just open your microphone, introduce yourself, say hi. Um, Karen Castellanos. Hi, my name is Karen, Karen Castellanos. Um, hi, Karen, from... wonderful to meet you. Wonderful to meet you too. Um, I'm from Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. And I, I will share an experience. I'm from Monterrey, but right now I live in Chihuahua. Um, so moving there was very difficult, very tough, because my grandmother got sick, so that's why we moved. But I really didn't know anyone. And I moved in the middle of a whole school year. So I entered and I was a new girl. I didn't know any of the subjects they were taking. They were different. And it was very hard for me to make new friends because I never had to. I was always in the same school since I was in kindergarten. But little by little and soon enough, I got adopted. And now they are my best, best, best friends. And we still hang out. So. Um, I had to gather a lot of courage to talk to people and, and hear them, and it was difficult, but it was worth it. So I really, I really enjoy social connecting. Oh yeah, that's a that's a great story. When you're moving to somewhere new, did you say you moved in the middle of the school year? Yeah, I moved like um, three tough. months from ending. Oh wow! So after a, the whole year was almost over wow you had to be really super brave to start <laughs> of course you were kind of thrown into it so yeah it was like that's a great that's a great story and an absolute one of having to be outside of your comfort zone and to make new friends and come um to the school year already in the middle of it when a lot's already established. That's a great example. Bravo to you. You're brave. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Victor. Um, hey guys, I'm Victor. Hi. I'm nice from Brazil you. and I'm 16. So I want to talk about my first exchange experience. I did it when I was 11 years old and I went to Argentina all by myself. So I was in this country where I didn't speak Spanish yet. So I was trying to communicate and I didn't know how to talk to people. Plus I was very shy. So I was like, on my lane, not talking to anyone. And I saw these people around me just talking really fast in Spanish. And I was trying to under understand what was going on, but I couldn't because I didn't. So it was like, at first it was really stressful, but then I got, you know, I made a lot of friends and started to learn actually Spanish and speak with people and interact. And I still have friends that I talk um, today with them, so. It was great. Wow. So you had to learn a whole new, you were learning a whole new language? Yeah, uh, I, wait, wait. I, I'm from Brazil, so I, I, speak, I speak Portuguese, so it's kind of similar. But 
and they speak really fast, so I couldn't <laughs> understand like almost of what they, they were saying. Wow, that's <laughs> super brave, first of all, and how wonderful that you were able to pick up on the language and learn that. I don't know if I would uh, be brave enough to, to do that, but that's an amazing story, Victor. Thank you for sharing, and welcome. Okay, uh, I think I see... Who else would like to share? I'm looking at the chat right here. Any other stories? I think I've done the same thing. I'll share um, as um, as Karen shared too, and and Victor. Um, moving is is tough now, um, especially when you're starting a new school. I've done that a few times, and you're the the new person. I think um, that's always challenging, and will continue. You know, whether you're starting a new college or you're starting a new job. Um, uh, it's always a little nerve wracking the first time you kind of go in and meet people. In fact, even being here on zoom, because I'm used to being in front of an audience in front of everybody and being able to, um, interact in such a different way, being on camera for me is a whole new experience. And I think a lot of you shared, uh, you know, the same, the same emotions to, uh, being on the call, but. Uh, everyone here is doing amazing. So we'll, con we'll move forward. And if you do have uh, a story or something comes to your mind, please raise your hand because um, uh, I love hearing your stories. Um, um, Mrs. Heather, yeah. we have other two participants. I don't oh, know. If, um, that would be wonderful. Yes. So uh, first of all, um, Mariana. Mariana. So, hi, I am Mariana Ortega. I am from Colombia and I am 16 years old. Mm. So, I, besides from MUNs and social things, I am a dancer. But I have always been kind of insecure in all the, well, in all the environment that sometimes dancers have, have to be perfect bodies and stuff. So, I was always insecure about that. And one of my favorite kinds of dance is like Arabic, like belly dance and all that stuff. And the standard is to be a perfect body. And I was really shy about that. But then I went into a competition and I decided to uh, go out of my comfort zone and I did it. I did what I like to do and I did amazing. And I even got a scholarship from a dance academy after that. So, yeah, there was a moment I went out of my comfort zone. And, yeah, I got a really nice result that I will never regret in my whole life. Bravo to you. Yeah, performing in front of people can be really uh, outside of your social comfort zone. But good for you for taking on that challenge. And I'm so happy that you had a, a positive experience with that. And I see another hand up. Yeah, so first, let's go with Alejandro, and then I hope I am saying your name right, Ashwath. I hope I am saying it right. I am so sorry. One of our competition winners, yeah. Should I go? Yeah, sure. please, Alejandro. Hi, Heather. Thank you for the video. Uh, I just Hello, want to say Alejandro. that. Hi. Uh, like, I have a similar story to Victor because, uh, I mean, it was also like exchange experience. I was 13 years old and or 12, I don't remember. And I went to uh, like six, like one year to Canada, to Vancouver as exchange student. And I don't know, it was like the first time I was a, like it was my first, first exchange. And as you know, like a, Canada is quite a multicultural country. So when I went to school, like there were people from like re literally old places so in the classroom, it was quite a, a multicultural experience and I didn't know like uh, who to talk to. Uh, we had like French class and at first I was like, I felt like isolated. But then like uh, I realized that other people felt the same as me because there are a lot of exchange students and we started like hanging out and being friends. And uh, it was like quite good. Like at the end, 
I became very confident and uh, I actually became like a little bit popular just to say something. <laughs> and it was a very good experience. And just to say something else, uh, like when I was, I was two years like in the camp uh, in 2018 and this was like a really out of a uh, comfort zone because I wasn't usual, like used to speaking like to a lot of people. And like the secretary general told me to speak like in the in a conference. And at first I did good, but then I said like a bad word in Spanish because I'm from Colombia and, and that ended badly. But then again, it was also like a good experience because I learned. Oh, thank you, Alejandro. So do you speak French now? Did you learn how to speak French? I was in the, yeah, no, like uh, in my school, I also learned French, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, especially if you go to a place where there's multiple language being spoken, that can be that can be a challenge and a bit intimidating for sure. OK, uh, another hand. Yeah. Ashwa. Ashwa. Yes. Hello, all. I'm Ashwa Chalavari from India. I'm 16. So I have an experience, I had an experience when I was 14 years old, I, for the first time I traveled out of my state with, without my parents for attending a judo tournament. So there, uh, it was a three-day travel by train. We went to a state called Maharashtra and over there, the people of that state speak only Hindi, but, but in the case of my Mine, I know only my mother tongue Tamil and English. So I felt it very hard to adopt to that state. So it was, I was, I was literally, I, I was under the, I was with my coach and I, I didn't move a inch from him. I was always with him and I was, I was under him. So after uh, uh, we, we stayed there for a week and in that tournament, I won bronze medal. When I when I was coming out of that state, I I learned how to read some words and speak some words. So that was my experience. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing. So I mean, a lot of you have had the same types of experiences going outside of your social comfort zone, especially in a place where. You might be in a, a, a new school, um, you're traveling by yourself for the first time, you're going to a different country um, where you maybe even don't even speak the language. Um, uh, really great uh, stories. But curious, uh, just to add to that uh, question in the discussion here, did you find when you even went outside of your social comfort zone that maybe once you kind of got over that hump. It wasn't as scary as you thought. And maybe you found that you actually um, found more things that you had in common and the nervousness and, you know, all that kind of stuff was a little bit, um, you know, eased up just a little bit. Any hand? Did it get easier for you, Ashwath, once you got past that hump, especially traveling by yourself? Yeah, after, for the first few days, I felt very hard. But after that, it got, I was used to that. You got really used to it. Alejandro, what about, what about you? Once you kind of uh, eased into it a little bit, you got over that, that hump, was it not so, not as scary? Yeah, that's right. And like since then, uh, I actually try to do things that scare me because like this care, like the fear is usually bigger than the like what actually happens. That's a good point. It's a really good point. OK, well, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for sharing your stories. I hope that we have more stories going along the line because I I, I think this is a great opportunity for us to chat with each other and it's just it's easier for us to just keep our mute on uh it's a lot harder for us to just unmute and kind of jump in and i'm with all of you in you know a little bit of that uh going outside of my social comfort zone uh being aligned with everyone today so uh but i want to talk about peace and i want to talk about our 
cultural understanding uh, in regards to peace and being um, global citizens and and talk about culture and what is culture. And I really hope to get these ideas from all of you because you're all over the world right now. And and this is what uh, culture is. It's it's all of us. It's it's you. It's me. And um, so I'm going to put up a slideshow. I'm going to share a screen. Bear with me. Let's hope that this comes up really friendly like and you can still hear me. Okay, I'm going to bring this up. I'm going to share. I'm going to unmute that. Okay, and I'm going to come down here like this. Okay, beautiful. Can everyone see my screen okay and hear me as well? <laughs> yes. Okay, super. Wonderful. So uh, I want to talk about cultural awareness and understanding. I do have a bit of slides. I don't want to uh, put everyone to sleep by PowerPoint. So I hope just to touch upon these, but mostly have a discussion and really learn uh, from you and everyone's thoughts here. So I want to find out from you um, what is culture and where do we find it? Uh, you can see from this slide, it's, it's everywhere. Culture is everywhere. What is culture, though? So when somebody asks, uh, you know, what is culture? What is your culture? What are your definitions? And I'll put up the a chat. Mariana, I'm not sure if you're on the chat as well, so we can see anybody who raises their hand or feel free to unmute as well. So my question to you is, what is culture? And I'm going to try to minimize my screen if I can for a moment here. Oh, two participants raised hands. Let me click on this. Okay, it's working. Okay. Um, and I can't see who raised their hand because I'm not seeing the chat right this second. Uh, so I can I have I somebody can... just unmute? <laughs> yeah, um, I, can, I can moderate that. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Okay, Thank so uh, Simar, go ahead. Ah. Um, thank you so much. I generally need that push or that permission from people to go ahead and admit myself. So um, in my opinion, culture is the local traditions, the local, um, the local beauty of a particular area. Like I've been using this example from sixth grade when I had a criti critical thinking question in my uh, exam paper that what do you think is uh, cultural diversity and what do you think um, the diversity of a particular country means? So I, I generally always use this example that it's like a painting so that we have like a huge painting with so many many colors and each color is beautiful in its own way like for example many people like pink uh, because they find that color very soothing many people like orange because they feel energetic by seeing that color many like yellow because they feel happy so and similarly, each um, particular tradition has a different color, a different shade, and a different tone. It has its own mm. speciality. So when they all come together, they form a painting. And when we look at that painting, we all just go like, wow, it's so pretty. So generally, when I look at the different, uh, the different cultures of different countries around the world, like I'm getting the opportunity right now to look at the cultures of many countries via Ayman, I feel so happy that I'm a part of this. So I think that's what culture is. Oh, thank you for sharing. Simar, can I ask you a question? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for being um, so brave and, and unmuting. And thank you for sharing your, your vision of culture with color and the idea of a painting. I love that because, um, uh, yeah, all these colors come together into something quite, quite beautiful and quite magical. Do you have a sample of you were talking about color and like orange being of energy and yellow uh, being color that makes people happy? Do you have an example of a color where you from that it has a particular meaning? 
Um, you can say that actually India is like very diverse. For example, uh, the color red is used in many uh, religious festivals and generally uh, when there there is a wedding so generally people wear a red lenga which is a clothing material i exactly don't know the reason why oh. but yes that is a special color over here oh that's very interesting so during during weddings uh, red is often worn more than like in the us uh, typically people wear white the bride Oh, interesting. Okay, cool. Oh, a few more hands up. Yeah. Um, what is culture to you? Giovanna Brito. So firstly, I wanted to say that I totally agree with Smar. And I I am Giovanna Brito from Brazil. And I just think like that culture is a bunch of habits and beliefs and all those customs that, that um, uh, community that, that a nation has and and all these beliefs, they, they kind of uh, lead the, the lives of these people like because they have beliefs and, 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 they, and their beliefs will impact their actions and how they will see the world and how they will act towards other people too. So culture is basically like what is in our head and our hearts, but ends up impacting in all our lives. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing, Giovanna. And Giovanna, where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Uh, Brazil. Yeah, I loved what you said. Um, oftentimes, culture will impact the way that we behave in, in, in different situations. That's very true. Okay, next to unmute. Yes. Um, Namya Joshi, I'm sorry. Yeah. According mm -hmm. to me, culture is the beauty that lies between the people and uh, the religious ways that they follow to uh, like do all things and the art that they create yeah. and all mm -hmm. the like, um, which they regard as uh, idol and like, Mostly it's the beauty that lies between them and the things like religious things that they follow, according to me, is the culture and the diversity. I love that. Yeah. The cultural diversity. Look at the cultural diversity we have here and the talent that just happened in the in the in the show that we saw uh, before I got on with all the music and the dance and the paintings that you saw in the background from Rwanda, Rwanda to India and uh, just amazing. Very beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Okay, who else do we have here that uh, brave that, enough to unmute? That one. Uh, Rasha Razmara. Yeah, hello. I'm Rasha. Hello. And I'm Iran. I think that uh, culture is kind of like um, like many beliefs and ideas that uh, a, a kind of ethnic or ethnicity and a group of people believe that. And uh, it's like... Um, it inherits and uh, other generations uh, believing those kind of uh, beliefs. And uh, it's like, uh, no matter uh, if it's right or if it's right or wrong, uh, they believe in it and they uh, like kind of, it influence, influences in their behaviors. And I think it's uh, the culture that uh, makes this uh, well, yeah, the culture makes this diversity, but I think it, it's the culture that uh, makes the innovation in people. Because uh, we can, for example, see other like ideas and stuff like that. So that's I think that makes us human. Yeah. Asha, that's that's uh, wonderful what you said, and I love the way that you said it, it's passed down from generations. Oftentimes, uh, cultures learned, and we're going to uh, talk about that. Um, it's something that um, we learn that's passed down and um, makes us who we are. And the other thing that I love that you said is that it, 
through our culture, um, innovation and uh, new ideas, new breakthroughs and different uh, subject matters also happen. I want to talk a little bit about that, but um, really insightful, the words that you said. Thank you so much for unmuting. Who's next? Anybody else want to share? Uh, is it okay one more and then you can Absolutely. Or Absolutely. Yes, I love this. I love chatting. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so... Um, the Salimi, go ahead. Hi, so Hi. I'm Yates from Iran, and I think everything, the diversity and like everything, it starts with a little behavior or a little story from very, very past, and then it extends. And when it comes to us, we call it culture, and it's what makes us different. Mm. Thank you for sharing. I love that you said it's it's our story, right? We all have we all have stories, and these stories um, um, is what makes us who we are um, together as a group, as well as um, us as individuals. So, uh, thank you for sharing that. I'm going to jump to the next slide here, and if I can, oh, maybe I need to go here. Uh, no. Let me hit the right key. Oh, there we go. Just a little bit of a delay. So I just want to give everyone fist bumps and props because your words really hit everything that um, that we had in our slide. It's a shared system of, of meanings. Uh, culture is our, is our shared beliefs, our values. Um, one of you mentioned it's the way that we behave. Oftentimes it's learned. So I liked, um, we talked about how it's passed from generation or our parents um, will teach us. Uh, it can be collective. So it can, um, meaning uh, an entire community can have a culture. And it can change over time. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't change at all over time. And um it's really about our experiences and the way that those experiences are interpreted and then the way that we carry um, out those experiences. So you guys are amazing in your, in your definition of culture. I'm going to go to the next slide. Here's a cultural wheel right here, if you're able to see it. It encompasses a, a, a little bit more of what is culture and some of the things that we might think about there might be a lot of underlining or things that we don't see that are also part of culture. For um, example, we talked about our values, uh, language, obviously. How about the food that we eat and the things that we drink? Um, our traditions, um, our tools and objects that we use uh, is one that we don't often think about. Uh, someone mentioned our stories and our knowledge uh, and the arts, you know, the art, uh, the dance that we have, music, all these things contribute to our culture. Is there anything in here? Uh, there's a lot of elements here. Some things are conscious, some things are unconscious, but what could we be missing? Do you see anything else after looking at this that might have sparked an idea in your mind? Uh raises your hand if you want to add to this wheel. What do you think we could add to this wheel that's part when you're thinking of your own culture that's not in here? Let's see, I have G. I have Giovanna on the screen. Is there anything here, Giovanna or Rasha or Nam, Namya, if I'm pronouncing your name right? Is there anything here that you think we could add to our cultural wheel that might not be there that you think is an important part of culture? Hi, oh. first of all. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Mahdi. I'm from Iran. I think social habits is kind of culture. Can you repeat what you said? Social? Social habits. A social habits. Wonderful addition. Yeah, that should be on the wheel. Absolutely. And in what way? Do you have an example of that? For example, yeah. In Iran, in Iran, when, first of all, 
see someone first of all that they say hello in culture of Iran or or after eating food we mm -hmm. say thanks I think these are kind of culture yeah exactly like how we introduce ourselves to people um that's a that's a really good one or how we say thank you might also be different how we express gratitude could also be um uh, different in in cultures anything else that we could maybe add to our wheel here um i would like to add maybe social and emotional needs for others okay social and emotional needs what what example do you have like um like you have to be kind and empathetic towards people and respect what they say and not be like a bit rude to them mm. and listen carefully what they say and then react so like yeah i think that's what you call social and emotional needs and have value for every person so you can add that in the values as well absolutely and do you think that different cultures express emotions differently like some cultures might be more emotionally expressive than others might be kind of held back which could be considered like cold or unfeeling but maybe it's just the way that they express emotions to uh, new people no it doesn't like feel that you should uh, think people about their culture that if someone is following this culture so he will be like that it uh, depends upon person to person like what is their like uh, perspective towards uh, culture so it's like whatever they think they'll be like that so you cannot like interpret that if this person is following this culture so he will be rude he can be nice as well so i think this will be my answer for that Yeah, that's right. But what if we're not familiar with that culture? Then could we take something the wrong way? Um, I think we should not judge people without knowing them, so we should understand before and then only make our perspective. That's right. I wonder um when we were talking um I I wonder if he's still on because I don't see um all, everyone's screen. Uh Alejandro, all of a sudden, are you, Alejandro, are you still listening? or maybe one of our other other speakers who yeah, maybe had um, an there are a couple of yeah there are a couple of, of hands oh right. beautiful yeah i wonder if we've had a you know experience too of hey maybe you went in a place where you weren't familiar with the culture and maybe something you you weren't aware of and it might have uh, you might have automatically made a judgment only because you didn't know that that was a a, a different culture or something that was done differently Yeah, so there's like at least like five or six hands raised. Okay, I, I will let you um, <laughs> take the hand. Yeah, awesome. Hi, babe. Thank so, you. Yeah, so Shura, go ahead. Go ahead. Um. So hi. I think uh, from my perspective, nationality is a big part of culture as well. Nationality. I don't know. Uh, for example, I'm Mexican and. But when I present to others, I always say, hi, I'm, well, if when I'm obviously in an international forum or when I'm pe with people from other countries, I present myself. And obviously in this presentation, you present yourself as part of your country. It's, I'm Mexican, for example. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Thank you for sharing. Okay, uh, next up, Sofia Idrisu. Um, so I would like to say that, oh, my name is Sophie Ujisu and I'm from Togo, where I live in the U.S. And so I wanted to say that something I think that's missing from the wheel <clears throat> is clothes. Like mm. in the culture, we have certain fabrics, certain designs that only certain type of people can wear. We have certain designs, certain fabrics that are only for certain types of occasions. Like we... So, like, I think that's one thing that should be added to the culture wheel. It's closed. It means a lot of things to different cultures. Absolutely, Sophia. That's a wonderful addition. I like that you even mentioned different fabrics. Do you have an example of of maybe a fabric or something that's used for one particular um, thing that you can share with us? Um, I do, but I'll have to go get it. Okay. We'll uh, if if we'll uh, we'll uh, put you on 
mute and you can go get it. That, that's really interesting. So fashion and clothes, yeah, it does play a big role in, in what, we're, what we're doing or a ceremony, for example, or a particular event. Um, that's huge part of the wheel. I think that's a great addition. Okay, next share. Okay, uh, next, Juliana. Juliana. Hi. I'm looking for uh, Juliana. There she is. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Perhaps like the physical appearance, uh, not only of like the cities, the nature, and where people live, mm -hmm. but maybe of the people too, like the average of the people. And I was also going to talk about clothes that Sophia brought up. Yeah, Sophia, you could, if you have your materials there, you could show it to us, please. Yeah, we'd love to see it. Um, so what I have here is a Ghanaian dress pattern. And so this is the pattern. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. This pattern, um, back in the, like, a long time ago, only Ashanti royals would, would wear this pattern. So um, this is the pattern. So, only worn by ro royals, you said? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's beautiful. Yeah, so yeah, even getting, even taking that um, a step a step further, not only the fabric, but maybe a particular pattern on that fabric could be, you know, is linked to something uh, within the culture. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Sophia. Thank you for getting that. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, next, we have Mariana Ortega. Mm -hmm. Hi. So when you mentioned if sometimes there was confusions between the cultures or misunderstanding, yeah. for example, here in Colombia in greeting, uh, normally we would uh, kiss the person on the cheek even if we don't know it. And sometimes I have traveled and I try to do it and people get really concerned or are like, get really uncomfortable because they think it's going to kiss them, but it's actually not. And people get really <laughs> confused about it. And they think one is flirting, but actually it's a uh, part of the tradition to when you meet someone, you kiss them mm -hmm. on the cheek or even if you're just greeting them. So that's one of the confusions that I mainly get when I travel to another country. Absolutely. That's a good point. And sometimes it's a, it's a kiss on two cheek on each cheek. Sometimes it's a multiple. And it, I think also in culture, the space that we have um, between each other, when we connect can also uh, be influenced by culture. For example, in the U S and I'm, I'm in Arizona But in the U.S. in general, we we kind of have a personal space. It's kind of like our arms length around each other. And it's like our personal bubble. Right. And so if somebody steps into that personal space, um, oftentimes you'll see that person take a step back so that they keep that distance. And it's different in other cultures where you might come up and give someone um, that you even just met for the first time, you might give them an embrace or a kiss on the cheek. It's oftentimes you might be um, closer to them when you're having a conversation. And this is very normal. Um, in, in the culture here, uh, Uh, like I said, we everyone kind of has their personal space. And if somebody came up to you that you didn't know, you might actually kind of take a step back. So <laughs> that that happens here oftentimes. But yeah, you're right. That's a, a, a perfect example. So it could be a little bit awkward if, you, if you're unaware of that and you go in as normal saying hello and somebody's like not used to that. <laughs> For sure. Thank you for sharing. Uh, lastly, we have Pradeep. Yes. He was on our um, uh, our team for organizing team for the uh, contest oh, this year. Awesome. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I see you're relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> if, you could, if you could turn your camera. No, no, no. I, didn't, I, I, I didn't see in, my, in the video. Mm. Nice to have you here. You did. Tell us where you're calling us you, from, where you. you're uh, visiting us from.
did you all see uh, the Nepal culture dance? I did not see. Hello. I did not see that dance. No, we can hear you. Go ahead, Pradeep. Did you did you see the culture dance of Nepal? I sent you the video. Uh, I I did not, Pradeep. Not yet. Oh, you didn't. You're it? you're connecting from Nepal. Yes, I'm connecting from Nepal, yeah. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. But so the I dance? Didn't, I didn't see you the PA video. Uh, I, I have not, no. Mm -mm, not yet. Poor connection. But we'll have to take a look at that dance. And of course, if you were on a half an hour before we got on here, there were there were other uh, dances that were happening too. An important part. Okay. Of okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, well, it looks like. Yeah, you can continue, Heather. Okay. Let's let's move to the next slide. Um, so cross-cultural awareness, which is what we, we, we want to have, we want to have cross-cultural awareness. It's about reflecting on our own habits, understanding ourselves, as well as understanding other ways of doing things, right? It doesn't mean that we have to accept them or take them in as our own, but it's the understanding of them and having um, uh, tolerance. But why is culture important? I put four little blocks of why culture is important um, and which part of our lives that it can influence. But I want to hear from all of you about why is it important? Why do we care? Why is culture such a big thing in our life? I mean, I don't know if I can answer because I'm the moderator right now. Who's speaking? Me, Nicole. I mean, I'm the mo I'm the moderator. Yes, of course. But I don't know if I can answer just very fast, um, so I don't just so I, don't, so I let the delegate speak. I think that it's important. I, think I lost somebody's audio. Can you hear? Hearing. Oh, Rasha, go ahead, Rasha. Yeah, I think it's important because uh, it's uh, the culture that makes us human. Oh, I'm not hearing. Keeps us the uh -oh. identity that we have. Okay. One, one moment. I'm gonna have to disconnect. Okay. <laughs> I lost my audio. Oh, can I continue? One moment, you guys. One moment. Let me mute myself. Yeah, I lost. I lost that. Uh, it died or something. So I need to go to audio settings. And I need to go to, this is the at, same as system or raw tech high definition. I'm not sure which one is the inside. Okay, let's try that. Okay, Rasha, can you try saying something? I just want to see if I can hear you through my computer. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, I'm not hearing you. Okay, one moment, Rasha, hold on, bear with me for a moment here. I lost my speaker. Um, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. I don't think it's the iTech. I wanna say it's, yeah, <laughs> get up there. Stop video. One minute, <laughs> you guys, I'm so sorry. I've had it on for a little bit. Uh, okay, audio settings, I'm gonna try same as system. Okay, now I'm gonna come here. My microphone is still, I might have to undo my microphone because I remember we had to take everything and start video. Rasha, can you say hello again? Hello, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Let me disconnect my, my system. I'm gonna just use my computer. One moment.
Okay. I'm going to try not, I'm going to over modulating just a little bit. Rasha, I'm so sorry. Uh, technology as you will. All the batteries died all at once. Can you try saying something again to see if I can hear you? Oh, can you hear me? I can now. I'm going to be listening very intently. I have a little bit of a feedback. Well, I was telling this, um, culture is something that makes us human because uh, it brings us diversity and uh, it makes us uh, a special every individual. Because, uh, for example, imagine uh, when there's culture, there, there are lots of behaviors and values uh, that uh, every, every ethnicity uh, like believes that. So some people believe in some, um, some kind of um, those values and they accept those kind of things. And uh, the other ones, for example, I don't know, like uh, they don't accept uh, the other ones or uh, at, at least a few things. So that brings a uh, diversity in, uh, between human. And uh, I think it's important because it makes us uh, special, everyone, every each. Person. Yeah, I love that, Rasha. You're right about that. Thank you for sharing. Did I see a bunch more hands? Yeah, there's like five or six. <laughs> yes, they were. Okay. okay. So next, Alejandro. Is Alejandro, back. yes, Alejandro. Okay, uh, just to be like academic, uh, culture is like the set of social constructs that separate us into groups. So I think it is really important culture because it's a set of very different worldviews of ways of life, at like the diversity that humans have, like different ways of living, of thinking, of having different relationships with other people. So I think it's very important because it's like maybe the beauty of being human, being different. Absolutely. It is. It's kind of what makes us all unique and special. Um, not only the things that uh, bring us together and the commonalities that we have, but the differences make us just as beautiful too. They always say it'd be boring if we were all exactly the same, right? Okay, next. Uh, can, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, I mean, I do. Okay, I had to do a quick quick audio. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Okay, thank you. Um, next, my, my DR. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my DR, if you're, if you're there, you can go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I'm here from Iran. And my answer is very short. I think mm -hmm. because culture is define element of any and every human society. That's right. Simply put and beautifully simple. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Yes. Uh, next, Namya Yoshi, go ahead. Yeah. I believe that culture is important because it is a strong part of a person's life which should be respected by all and uh, it influences a person's views his value and like all the hopes and loyalties the person has so it's like when you're working with people and like you have to understand their perspective and you should understand their culture so it is important to understand it as well because yeah. if you learn the culture it is easier to understand them so if you're understanding the culture, it's easy to understand the person. So like that is why the culture is important and so is the culture diversity. Beautifully said. Yep, you're absolutely right. When we become more culturally sensitive and we understand um, other cultures, it helps us to it helps us to not only to be more aware, but more understanding um, some of the differences in culture too. Doesn't mean that we have to take them on as our own, but we can have better understanding. Anybody else? Yeah, um, yeah, Simar, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. So I think that cultural, uh, cultural diversity and culture brings like people together. 
for example, um, if in case a person sitting in the United States, they are really interested in dance. Or right now, I just heard a delegate a few minutes back saying that she really likes dancing. So if in case um, mm -hmm. they are interested in dance, they can learn more about the different um, cultural dances present in different countries. Like we have the belly dance and then we have um, the... Um, various dances in India, the various dance forms like Bharatnatyam, Bharatnatyam, Kathakali, and so many more. So when they learn that, they develop the interest, they get better at expressing themselves, and they know more about the world. So uh, this may happen in art, like painting, music, and so many more things. So I think that culture brings like people together. Thank you. Absolutely. Has anybody here participated in a cultural dance or um, um, that was outside of their own culture? Uh, well, I think I, I have. Yeah. That's Mariana. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I'm a dancer in training to be a professional and I I dance everything from everything from Colombia, but also extern genres of music because I dance also flamenco that oh, is from wow. Spain, tango that is from Argentina, mm -hmm. a ballad that is from all the Middle East, and many different kind of cultures. I and I always try to expand my dancing abilities mm -hmm. so I can meet the world throughout another language that is the language of dancing and art. Oh, I love that. And it becomes like a language, right? It becomes the way that we can communicate with each other, even if we don't speak the language. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to move forward with this with the slide. Um, we've talked about culture and how it um, influences our lives. This is about food. This is about dress, music, our identity. Um, what about even architecture? Have we thought about architecture and how that can be um, and how our, our, the way that we build um, our houses or our buildings or our cities? Could that be culturally influenced as well? What do you guys think? Um, my my do you want to participate? Sorry, I should lower my hand. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, Shura, go ahead. So I wanted to say that it definitely well everything involves everything in general. Um, mm -hmm. But specifically for the aspect of ar if architecture, I really think, for example, that from colonization um, for uh, every country in history, uh, expanding to other countries, for example, in Mexico, in the city, we have uh, actually uh, buildings that are that were influenced by European architecture. So you can really see that features in our buildings in, in the in the um, in the old part of, of the city. In the and, old part, yeah. Yeah, and actually you can see the features, but you can also see the mixture of that features between the the, the things that the people uh, build by themselves. So it's a mm -hmm. mixture of everything and now more in 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 the in the in the globalized uh, society that we are in, everything is uh, mixed by everything the perspectives the values obviously you have this sense that you can that you keep from your own culture but mm -hmm. in a way uh, everything is connected yeah sometimes we're we're highly influenced now about through other cultures aren't we now yeah totally. anybody, anybody else before we move forward uh yeah there's russia go russia ahead. go ahead no, it's not me. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, guys. Okay, please. she unra she unraised her hand. I saw. Yeah, just please remember, <laughs> yeah. guys, to lower your hand. No, it's it's a it's a new thing. It's like when I'm in teaching school and my kids are like, no, 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 I'm not raising my hand. I'm stretching. I'm stretching. 
Yeah, just, just remember, guys, um, to lower your hand if you're not. <laughs> because, uh, it's so, kind of, go ahead. Um, Sofia, uh, Idrisu, uh, oh. Um, so I was going to say that I didn't really realize that architecture does influence culture until, I mean, no, culture does influence architecture until you said it. Because mm -hmm. um, I, I used to live in France and I just mm -hmm. realized that in America here, everything's bigger. When they build like <laughs> their, their streets and their shops and the stores, yes. they're all bigger. And then when you go to Europe, like any part of Europe, everything is smaller. Like the streets are mm -hmm. more narrow like the shops are smaller. So like, mm -hmm. I never really thought of that until you pointed it out. Yeah, it's it's true. And um, you having the experience of being in different places um, have really seen that in, in the US, everything's made very big. Our furniture is very big. Our house, you know, it's the buildings are big. The, the cars are made. Everything is made supersized, if you will. <laughs> supersized. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, and also, you know, culture has to do with our geographic location and that has to, and, and it weather and our environment influences that. So for me in the Southwest, where it might be over a hundred degrees, uh, we might be building things a little bit differently than if I lived in a colder environment, right? So these also might, uh, things that influence uh, my culture and my environment and uh, architecture itself as well. Uh, on this slide that you can see, I love this image right here because it's part of the iceberg that we do see is just that little bit on top. But what we don't see is that huge part of the iceberg that's on the bottom. And there's parts of culture um, that also that we don't see. For example, maybe the way that we think about time you know, in some cultures, it might be more polite uh, to be uh, what we call in the U.S. is fashionably late, um, where in other cultures, time is looked at as something is very punctual and you have to be uh, almost somewhere early um, to be what's considered on time. Do any of you have any experiences or stories about or, or in, in different cultures that you've been in or, or your own? Or how do you see time either showing up on time? This could be to work. This could be to family function. Maybe it's different for family and work. Um, but that's one of those things that are it's kind of underneath the surface. Any any thoughts to share? Um, if I may, Carol. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Um, I, I can say something, or you uh, can go. I think Ariel. Please, Ariel. Please, Carol, I am part of the leadership team, so Carol, please. Carol. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna talk about here in Brazil. Okay. Um, mostly where I'm from, because we have different cultures. But I think that this is like an understatement here in Brazil, or at least like here with here are the persons that I'm with. Um, when we have to be somewhere, like sometime, like 2 p.m., and then um, we get ready and, like, we're talking to the person, like, are you there? Are you coming? And they're like, no, I'm, I'm leaving my house. Five minutes, I'm there. <laughs> and the person's, like, still changing, you know? That's something that everybody, like, does. <laughs> like, we also joke about it because we do it. And it's not because, oh, you, you are all unpolite and everything. No, we just we just do it. When it's something really, really important, like, uh -huh. um, we don't do it. But when we're, like, with friends, and they say, mm -hmm. you're, we're arriving at the party. Yeah, I'm arriving at the party. Like, I'm it's more casual. House. Yeah, when it's something late. casual. And the person says, like, I'm just leaving my house. I'm, I'm in traffic. Five minutes, I'm there. <laughs> She's in, in traffic. She's in her house, changing her clothes. Mm -hmm. And I can say for, like, another country or anything but here when it's like something that's like not not really serious when it's like hanging out with friends or going to a party and the person's like are you there and there and the person's like yeah i'm, I'm arriving <laughs> i'm arriving <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing. No, it's true. And sometimes within a culture, sometimes if, it, if it's more of a, a serious or a, a work thing, maybe it's even looked at a little bit different than, than with your friends. I think here um, uh, we, we seem to kind of be uh, scheduled by the clock and the watch. 
Um, even for things that are a little bit more casual, you know, it's um, it might not be seen as uh, uh, polite or or good if if you don't call ahead at least if you're going to be if you're going to be late <laughs> unless you know the person really really well like if they're your BFF you can it's a little more casual I guess anybody else uh, Alejandro is... like I raised my hand but uh, oh I, I see much. your hand raised perfect but if like if anybody you're not stretching done... right. No. <laughs> Go ahead, Alejandro. Okay. Like uh, in Colombia, I'm from Colombia, and I studied in a school called the Canadian School. So we had oh. like Canadian teachers and everything. Mm. So like it's the same thing. About, like I'm punctual. I consider myself to be a punctual person. But like when we had classes with the uh, Canadian <laughs> teachers after the like the break, uh, mm -hmm. Like, let's say uh, it, we were to be there at 1030. People mm -hmm. started like being there, like getting there at 1030. Uh, and the teacher was always five minutes before to be there at 1030. So I, I, I think that's like one thing that we had. So every time we were late or uh, every time like uh, the teacher wanted to uh, take back the time, but uh, by making us stay more time, they they said like, Oh no, but you you like got here at 10:30 Colombian time. So you have to stay here uh, till I don't know 11:30 Colombian time. <laughs> so that there's no getting out of class early. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's one of those things that is sort of the um it can be sort of an undertone of culture of how we view time. Anybody else before we move to the next slide? Oh, oh yeah. I, I see two hands. Oh, oh somebody new. <laughs> it's money, it's money. Go, go, go. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it's kind of related with Alejand what Alejandro said. Uh, for example, I used to in China. So uh, in there, um, when was the uh, meetings or class, uh, I was always kind of late because they were saying like... <laughs> <laughs> like uh you ha you have to be here at 11 so it was like 11 20 um or or even like they was always like starting so punctual so i have to like wake up a little bit earlier before uh the like the normal time yeah. so yeah it's kind of um, interesting how two different cultures they uh, have uh different kind of uh ideas ideas yeah, yeah. and how the, like how to be punctual it's something like very very strict for them and not mm -hmm. so strict for us so it's kind of like more relaxed so yeah yeah definitely um and i know in my family growing up um my my family was in the um uh, military, uh, the armed forces here. And so um, I grew up with the idea that if I wasn't early, I was already late. So that became a habit for, for me. Even in this meeting, I was here 45 minutes before <laughs> my time to start, uh, which was wonderful because then I got to see all the amazing performances. But um, that's something that is passed, sometimes passed down um, through yeah. generations. Uh Yes, mm -hmm. and when I came back for, due to this coronavirus pandemic, yeah. um, with, when in some meetings before in Panama was uh, was contained, um, I was always like ten minutes before in something in some places of where I'm going to meet someone. So mm -hmm. I was like, and everybody asked me like, "Why are you so early here?" I was like, "I don't know. <laughs> it's just like." Uh, <laughs> Just uh, <laughs> yeah. Time. yeah. Right. So, what about for our Zoom calls? Are we all sort of like we're on a we try to stay on a good schedule to, because we have people from all over the world, so we just try to be mindful yeah. of, of the time and and the way that we work, the work ethic, the way that we work is also something that um, I feel can be culturally based, right? Some cultures are a little bit more. Um, relaxed about the workday um, and some, and maybe they have more breaks, maybe, um, and uh, other cultures are 
you know, um, work differently, you know, um, maybe just get up and start the day and like never stop. I don't know if any of you have seen or experienced that. Um, but most of you who are going to be, you know, working in these global groups and global economies, that's something to keep in mind, um, you know, different work ethics. Um, anything else before we move forward? Should I we just have one more participant that has Sure, yeah, absolutely. I love I love um, the discussion. All right, do you want to go, um, Ireli? No, you first. Oh, uh, I think we're going to talk about the same things, actually. Because <laughs> we live, we live in Mexico. We both live in Mexico. And mm -hmm. for example, we are we have a very, very bad habit, which is being unpunctual. Okay. And we'll being punctual or not punctual? No, unpunctual. Unpunctual, so, not on time. So, yeah, so basically when someone asks you, I don't know, to be at 3 p.m., you have to like expect them at 3, 3.30 or 4 p.m. because mm. we have like this, um, this space, this gap of time where we always consider because people have the bad habit of, of always arriving a little bit later. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and those things kind of can get in our in our habits, right? And, um, and then it's hard to be mindful when we're in a different uh, culture or visiting somebody else that, you know, they might think of it a little differently. But, but, you know, getting to this next slide, we often see things the way that we are, right? And the way that we do things, not maybe as, um, um, as, as uh, they are, right? We see them through our own eyes, our own perspective. And sometimes we just kind of assume that everyone is that way. If I'm that way, everyone's that way, right? So, um, I, let me... Oh? oh, go ahead, Gabby. Hi. Hi. I'm Gabriela and I'm from Peru. And Peru, wonderful. Uh, about our worst ethic, we have that saying that is like, when you wake up early, God will help you. And that's <laughs> what we believe. Then we have a lot of superstitions. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, do you have an example of that? I'd love to hear an example like, of something. For example, we must have like a like a sign of prosperity and I don't know economic wellness and health, and those kind of things. We must have like two bulls together and okay. to keep it under, for example, your kitchen or. Or I don't know how to say it. Living room. Yes, and the and then these things kind of help bring in the energy of like good health and prosperity, mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, uh, and I'm sure everyone here has maybe some example of you know something that uh, of different like superstitions like that. Anybody else have an example of something in their uh, culture that that's sort of a superstition? I'll have to think um, of an example here. Like we don't walk under a ladders uh, considered very bad luck or a black cat that might walk in front of you. Or if you break a mirror, totally bad. Very, very bad. Here in Brazil, uh, if you like leave your flip-flops -flop, flip like flipped, uh, they say that your mother is going to die. <gasps> oh my gosh, where are my shoes? <laughs> <laughs> So if your flip-flops are like turned upside down? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. That's something to really keep in, in mind. Any others? I have a question for Victor. Where are you from, Victor? Like just um, from curiosity. Oh, I'm from Brazil, but I'm from, uh, well, not it's not known. It's Espiritu Santo. But, you know, Rio, Rio de Janeiro. So it's like. Uh, Rio is here and Espiritu Santo is right above it. So it's here. So it's not well known, but you know. A small town. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay, cool. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, so um, that's something I had no idea. I love learning about these things, the shoes um, upside down. The other thing too, that is um, in different cultures, you can see from the slide, sometimes what's polite in one country may not be polite in another country. And sometimes these are even hand gestures. Anybody have an example of these? 
or any experience where you may have done something that you didn't realize wasn't so polite in maybe somewhere else. I know for some families here, taking off your shoes before you enter a home um, is a very good thing. It's kind of considered rude. And, and if, if you're not um, uh, taking off your shoes um, uh, when you enter a house, that's one sample here in some homes. Um, and some hand gestures, um, for example, um, let's see. We may, I, I, I had a slide, but then I ended up taking it out. So for example, a hand gesture that may not be polite in the U.S. culture, but it may be polite, it may not have the same meaning in another culture. You guys know what I'm talking about? I kind of have an example, but it's okay. not with me. I didn't want to show the example, but some, because then it would be me being, but you know, if you had like your middle finger up in the U.S., you would somebody that was very impolite, very impolite. You guys know what I'm talking about. I don't have to uh, show it here. But in some cultures, that actually has absolutely the different meaning than what it means here. Absolutely different. And it's not seen as impolite at all. So you always have to be careful about, you know, sometimes hand gestures and the way that we use our hands or, or like we do in the U.S., I talk with my hands a lot. Okay, someone else had a sample. Yeah, I have an example that is not mm -hmm. actually something that you do with your hands. And it's okay. not even me. Okay. Um, my, my, I think it's godmother. In, yeah, mm -hmm. godmother. She went to Europe with her husband. And here okay. in Brazil, we are very warm and everything. So we arrive in their places and they're like, good morning, good morning. And then she arrived at like uh, some place to have breakfast and she like put it her head instead of this door and said like good morning and everybody looked at her like she was really impolite everybody looked at oh. her like and, and she was like <laughs> sorry <laughs> and then she like answered yeah. it it began to be really quiet and her husband was like why'd you do that and she was like I didn't know because she know. wanted to say good morning. She didn't realize that. Yeah, so in some she cultures, it's a little bit more quiet and to yourselves, you know. Yeah. Alejandro, good example. That's that's a funny story. Alejandro, is your hand raised? Yeah. Go yes, for yes. it. Uh, like I think, in, like America, like in Colombia, and I think basically in America, if you you're eating and you make like sounds. It, Slurping like, sounds? Yeah, it's kind like of disgusting. Soup? Yeah. Uh, but in uh, Asia, at least, like a friend that I know from Japan and another one from South Korea, they do that a lot. They're like, and it's like kind of like expression that they say they're like enjoying the food. I, yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 You're right about that. But, uh, you know, here in the US, if I was to sip like that it, it's it'd be considered completely impolite no no sipping and slurping but yeah you're right about that interesting anybody else have an example um, I have. Oh, okay go for it who's next no juliana juliana go yeah, juliana, please i was just gonna say that at school i read a story that said exactly what alejandro just brought up uh um um, it was about a Chinese guy that he like burped on the table. Everyone thought he was impolite, but it's because in uh, in China, it seems that if you burp on the table, it shows that you're satisfied. Yeah, and I was also mm -hmm. going to say from Brazil. I'm sorry. And yeah, Brazilians can be very loud. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, don't like that. Where other cultures might be really quiet and to themselves, it would not be burping out loud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shura, babe. Yes. <laughs> there was another okay, hand. Oh, uh, Shura. Uh, well, it, my name is Shura, babe, but you can call me Shura, Shura? If, if that is more easier. If that is easier. Yeah. Very pretty name. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, well, the thing is, I have two examples, actually. Uh, okay. The first one is that I think it's general for Latin American and Latinos. Mm, but here in Mexico, we, the people, are very, very huggy and very, uh, like, with contact. We kiss you and we hug you. Thank <laughs> you very much. Because we're very, we're I like know, that. I know something feely. about that. <laughs> <laughs> Touchy-feely. And in some, well, in 
in some other uh, countries and cultures they don't. And the other example is about the tips. So when you go to a restaurant, you eat and things like that. And if, I think that's the uh, that's um, the thing in the United States, in Mexico, and in some parts in Latin America. I cannot say it for for the whole uh, continent, but you have to mm -hmm. give a tip to the waitress or the waiter uh, oh. when you eat, right? So it's you have yeah to, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, it's the polite thing. So yes. As I can recall, in, in Japan and in um, some um, countries in Asia, uh, if you give a tip, it's, it's uh, irrespectful and it's it's something bad, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a good point. Maybe we need to even add that to our cultural circle is the way, the way that we use money, right? And that includes the way that we interact or, or tip a waiter or not tip a waiter. Um, yeah, in the U.S., if, if you did not, it would be considered a very big insult, right? You, you actually want to, you know, over tip, you know, to show your gratitude and appreciation. So the more, the better. <laughs> I like that. Good examples, you guys. And, uh, and the superstitions and stuff that, you know, that are culturally uh, derived that we have. I know when I was in Romania, I had a, a little bit of a faux pas because um, oftentimes the, here we might whistle uh, while we're doing stuff just to pass the time. And I remember when I was one of my first times in the country and I was whistling in my in my friend's apartment while she was making breakfast one morning and she turned around and looked at me as if I broke a mirror, you know, in the U.S. It was like absolutely stop whistling. It's very, very bad luck. Uh, to whistle inside uh, the home. You can whistle outside the home, but never ever inside the home. And I had absolutely no idea. So we carry these things too that are culturally become part of our culture, right? You guys had fantastic examples. Guy, um, I want to be mindful of the time. No, We've don't just worry. been having so much wonderful you. discussion that I want to... Uh, don't worry about the time. Just keep going because... Someone wrote something about sweeping someone's leg, someone's feet. I don't know what uh, what was that about. Sweeping someone's leg? Oh. Sweeping. So I would like to hear more about that. Oh, red quartz. I see something too. Um, oh, oh, red so quartz. So energy. Gabby wrote that. Okay, please let us know about that, more about that. Mm -hmm. I want to hear more. The thing about the sweeping, sweeping the feet? Yes. So what is yes, okay. So yeah, I'm kind of looking oh. at the chat. I've got two things going on. Go ahead. So here in, well, in Colombia, because I'm originally from Colombia, but um, I live in Mexico at the moment, but in Colombia, and I think it's in some parts of Colombia, but uh, my mom always told me that when you're sweeping the floor, and if you sweep someone's feet, or if you sweep your feet, it, like your own feet. Um, with the broom? Yeah, with the broom. Oh, okay. That you can't marry. Oh. Like, it's okay. bad luck. It means that you're never going to marry. Oh, no. So do people, if somebody's sweeping, everyone's like clearing the room? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or some people might be headed up to the broom. Sweep my feet. <laughs> Hold on a moment. Hold on. Because when I, you said I, sweep my sweep the feet, I actually was like thinking of a martial art, like actually like taking somebody's feet out from underneath them. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just... Um, so okay, you, please. I want... No, no. I want yeah. to record it because I don't... It's strange. And I'll tell you why. why? Explain again. And what part of Colombia, again... And uh, where probably we were born in Colombia, and ex explain that again one more time because <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, are you recording? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I am from like my entire family is from Medellin and Cali. Medellin. Okay, yes, I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've always told me that uh, if you're sweeping the floors mm -hmm. and with a broom, and mm -hmm. somebody sweeps over your feet or you sweep over your own feet, it means that you won't ever marry. Oh. Yeah. So that so, was a no-no. I guess that was a no-no. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody starts to like... Everybody <laughs> That's a no-no. Like, so so oh. when someone is sweeping, you just have to jump. Uh, go and as high people as are possible. clearing the room, Guy. They're, they're <laughs> backing up, backing but away. One question. Was that true also for men or just for lady, for girls? I always, oh, don't know. I always thought it was for everyone. Like my parents always thought it was for okay. everyone. Okay. Interesting. That's interesting. interesting. I saw in the chat yeah. uh, too, somebody was mentioning um, um, a red quartz. Was it Gabby? 
This sounded very interesting to me yeah. too. The reason yeah. I was asking because there's something very similar in uh, in the in Cameroon, in the west part of Cameroon, where I grew up. What? That's why I was fascinated. What What, what do they do in Cameroon? No-no. It was a no-no to sweep someone's feet with a broom. Oh, I don't remember the, the consequences, but I'm going to dig into that now. That <laughs> Guy, so is it for the strange. same reason? It, probably, probably the same reason. Yeah, and, uh, and this is oh, Colombia has like a lot of a- African descendants. Yeah, so that's a lot of African traditions in the Colombian culture. That's for wow. me is interesting. That's for me is actually a subject of research. I'm going to be asking. That is interesting. And uh, I'm really happy you shared that because again, I was like, oh, really? Because I remember hearing that when I was a little boy, my mom was saying things like that. Thank you very yeah. much for sharing that. Very interesting. And, and also like, okay, so within these all things in these discussions, we're finding some of these similarities between cultures that you would think, you know, ha- wait, why is that exactly. even remotely uh, the same thing that we might have in our culture? How did that happen? Mm-hmm. It'd be kind of cool to, interesting to see what other commonalities of superstitions we have. Somebody mentioned uh, during Chinese New Year, one sweeps their house to prevent sweeping away of the good fortune. Uh, yeah, that's me. I am. I live in Malaysia, so mm. we we live with other races like the Malay race and the Chinese race. So I have lots of friends who are Chinese, and they told me that before China, uh, during Chinese New Year, no one sleep, sweeps their houses because uh, because when you sweep the house, it's actually like symbolizing that you sweep a, sweep away good fortune. Ah. So is it only during New Year's or it's best not to sweep at all? No, only during New Year. During New Year. There was one I read about a suitcase. Who was speaking about that? Oh, I said that. What? What? Tell us the suitcase one. Like in New Year's Eve and in Christmas, there are a lot of superstitions. And one is that if you run with suitcases, like with your family in New Year's Eve, it will make you most likely to travel in the next year. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's very one. funny. And if you use yeah. it, like do yellow people actually underwear. do that? Yeah, I like a lot of every people. Every single uh, New Year's, there are really? many of those. And if you use like yellow yellow underwear, it's like a good luck sign. Like in New Year's New Year's Eve. And we also, but you never know who's wearing it. Only you know. I mean, <laughs> some people like, so and running, running with suitcases for each other. Are you sure? Oh, I'm gonna have to so try. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to the the business of selling underwear, I should I should sell yellow one more, right? <laughs> ah. Yes, in December. In December. At, in know? December, yeah, it, that's interesting. Wow. Yellow underwear goes on sale. <laughs> yeah, like, actually, amazing what else did i see here in the in the chat yeah if, if i if i may i'm so sorry i'm as co-host i am not able to raise my hand but actually that that in Mexico of the underwear in new year's eve is really common like you were really pants, um you were like white for peace you were you were yellow um if you want to have money and prosperity so yeah it's like what color uh, yellow for money. So yellow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is yeah. really interesting to me. I I'm fascinated by that. Okay. Yeah. This still practice today. Looks like looks like I'll have to. Um, uh, Juliana, would you like to go next? Mm-hmm. Juliana, yes, I'm sorry. I just remember some superstitions. Uh, yeah. In Brazil, we have a superstition on New New Year's Eve that we have to eat 12 grapes because, uh, for the 12 months of the year. And another thing is that we have a superstition with salt. Uh, mm. Like if someone is like at, at dinner and he says, oh, pass the salt, you can give it directly to his hand. You have to put it on the table and then the person gets it, you know. Wonderful. Luck if you hand it into his hand. That's interesting. Anyone else? I'm learning a lot. Uh, I would like to share one. Juliana, go for it. 
Unmute. I'm reading this one. If you dance next to the Christmas tree. Ooh. Okay, Juliana? Juliana? No, she just spoke. Oh, okay, somebody said they wanted to speak. Who, who was yeah, it? Yeah, uh, I would like to tell oh. something. There you are. Okay. So one day, like, my mother was just hanging the clothes outside. So, like, she saw one black manna, and she said, oh, one for sorrow. And then she saw two together, and she said, two for joy. So, like, that means if you see one, then you get sorrow, and if you see two, then you get joy. Two like, black I umbrellas? Just, no, if you see two black birds, which are called manna, oh. then you call it two for joy. And if you see one, then you call it uh, one for sorrow. So oh, I, I found that hilarious. That's a good. That's a good one. I haven't heard that one before either. Okay. Um, Mariana, would you like to go next? Yes, Mariana. I saw Mariana uh, wrote somebody. Somebody wrote why um, about the dancing next to the Christmas tree, and somebody asked where. Okay. Yeah. Can you share uh, more about in, that? in Columbia. Yeah, it's in Colombia. I don't know if in all the country, but there are two, tra well, three traditions in the Christmas and next year time to get love. And first, it's using the red underwear. Second oh. is hiding, hiding down the table. And hiding third, under the table, you mean? Like hiding yeah. under the yeah, table? Um, okay. Yeah. And last is dancing around the tree when the clock takes like 12 you have to dance around the tree and you will get locked in next year oh my gosh I have so much to remember for uh, this holiday there's a lot I'm gonna have to be doing <laughs> that's great so do people still keep that tradition are there people that actually you know dance around the tree and make sure that they they're wearing their red and everything yeah uh, they always do it those traditions always we do it on the New Year's Eve, or also the beans on their pockets, the bill on beans and pockets. The, yeah, that brings good luck and money. And if you put a dollar or a bill in your shoe, you will get money also. There are a okay. lot of those beliefs in Colombia. Yeah, I see another one from Giovanna. If you find a penny in the street, you keep it in your wallet to attract money. So do you think that it's also the same in different cities, not just your town and city where you're from, but this is this is all of Colombia? Yeah, well, I know people from, I'm from Cucuta, but I know people from Medellin, Bogota, Cali, and the part of the coast that do it also. So I think it's mostly in Colombia, but I'm saying because I know there are many people from Colombia here and mm -hmm. they may say, oh, I don't do that here. But yeah. it's also from the family, and but it's not true yeah. to see it in Colombia. Yeah. Wow. Anybody else have anything to add? I'm kind of looking at the chat before um, before we move forward. Yeah, we. There's uh, a lot of new uh, new things that I want to try now. Mr. Heather, there are two uh, people raising their hand. Oh, wonderful! Let's unmute. So, uh, Seymour, would you like to go next? Seymour. Oh, yes, so contest. this one is really, really interesting. So okay. there are a couple of them. So okay. one is that um, if in case you're driving a car or you're in a transport or even if when you're walking, if you see a black cat passing or crossing in front of you, it's mm -hmm. very, very in luck. Something really bad is going to happen to you. So mm -hmm. that is the one thing. Another thing is that... Um, you cannot, uh, you know, eat with your left hand because it's considered as impure mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. time. And your right hand, it is always clean, always. So you need to eat with that hand only. Then um, another one is that um, uh, the parents, they can actually, uh, you know, hit children uh, if they are doing bad in something or mm -hmm. they are not doing something good. But mm -hmm. in other countries around the world, that would be considered child abuse. So yes. that is there. And um, a last one is that um, you are not supposed to bite your nails and you're not supposed to cut your nails during night, uh, night because ghosts will come be before you. So not at night. You said at night for cutting the nails. Yes. At the night. Wow. 
Wow, you I'm learning a lot. <laughs> we all learn. That's amazing. And a lot of things that I see in the chat, um, I'm seeing a lot of common things too that um in different in different parts of the world and as as Guy was mentioning with the idea of the broom and sweeping a lot that surround, you know, with money and good luck and traditional things um, that happen sometimes around the holidays. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing One these point, ideas. Uh, Go ahead. Mariana? Mariana? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm just, do you, uh, given that, um, okay, people have, the red underwear thing, dancing next to the thing. Do you know any single person that was not wealthy and then did that and became wealthy after that? Do you know one single person? Oh, yeah. Oh, do you? Well, do you know? I mean, well, the thing is that the tradition in the cities are that if you dance around the tree and it has to be like you're single. Uh -huh. I heard this from my grandma. You have to be single. Okay. And if you have a couple, uh, it is most, if you dance around the tree and you have a couple, it's most likely that the couple cheats on you the next year. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, but, but, but has any of this ever, uh, have you known anybody where any of this has actually happened to them if they didn't dance or if they did dance? Did you ever, well, anybody yeah, ever try to find happen. out? Uh? Well, I mean, those are kind of beliefs that everyone has, but it has been a tradition since years yeah. ago, we don't, and <laughs> we still do it, and it kind of works, kind of works. So basically... Just like, for example, or, yeah. Yeah, they, they work. For example, <laughs> in my case, they have worked. Not, oh. not the one... I don't, I don't dance around the tree because I know it's not <laughs> going to happen, but... <laughs> But about the pot, about the beans in the pocket or running with the suitcase, mm -hmm. I have tried it and it really works. I'm gonna it, try it running works with the suitcase. For, okay. Yeah, it's really good, and I know people that have worked this. Okay, Mariana, let's have a deal. Next year, uh, on Christmas on New Year Eve. I will be around, okay? A video chat. You do that, and then the next day, the next, on January, you send me the mo all the money, the new money you got, okay? Deal? <laughs> I promise, I will. Okay, I perfect, promise. deal. Okay, thank you. <laughs> deal. <laughs> Let's see if any of these things work. That, that's wonderful. No, no, actually, they're not meant to be checked. Just, not just, yeah, we just know they happen. Don't need to verify, okay? Please, don't spoil the, <laughs> don't spoil the tradition, Heather. We just know they work, so we don't try to verify. <laughs> <laughs> we all just believe that they work. Yeah, we just believe yeah, we and move on. You'll mess up everything if you start trying to 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 verify. <laughs> well, that's actually a good point, Keith. Yeah, okay. that's right. That's wonderful. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. I see a few more raised hands. Um. Yes. Yeah, so we may go with Sergio. Go ahead. Hello. Do Do you Hi. see me? Um. Do you hear me? I yes, hear you. Yeah. Okay. My name is Sergio. I'm also from Colombia. I'm more on the central mm -hmm. part from a city called Pereira. And here we we do other type of, of things. For example, we don't usually dance around the tree, but we we have to we have to eat around the tree around the tree in order to have mm -hmm. kind of abundance on on the next year. Also, there is some this uh, what we call grandma superstitions that are, for example, if you're a woman and somebody puts a broom or or a sweeper on your feet, you will be a uh, single for all your life and things like that. So, so they're kind of Similar. if 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 somebody brooms or sweeps your feet, you it's bad luck. Also, if you go on the staircase or on the, this mm -hmm. uh, ladder, or if you, if you, here we also use something that is for, for animals, like in the part where I live, mm -hmm. there, are, there are some birds that you hear them and it's very likely that a relative passes away or that's what they say. Oh. Wait, can you can you say that again about the the animal? 
the, there are some types of birds. I mean, I uh, I don't know like which bird it is. Like, no, no. You you usually don't see them. You just hear oh. them. And oh. there is kind of, I, I haven't recognized any of them. It's just kind of grandmas and moms who do that. <laughs> Okay. Because yeah. they know what they're talking about, but it, there's there are some birds that you hear them, and it's very likely that a relative passes away. Like just you hear them in flight. Y yeah, or, or yeah. singing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, here we have sort of a tradition around like a raven. If you see like a raven, it's not really a, a good luck. Um, in that bird. Um, but yeah, you're right. Uh, Sergio, we have a lot of traditions and superstitions surrounding uh, animals, don't we? Yeah. yeah, I didn't even think about that so much. Except here we have like, you know, black cat. You never want a, a cat to go in front of you. <laughs> also uh, the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of, I mean, I know a lot of them that are with butterflies, like depending oh, on Oh, butterflies. The on the on the type of butterflies you find or if if some if any butterfly kind of uh, rests on your shoulder is that you will be you will have a new friends or a great company during that year if it if it rests on your hand is that you will make very good business deals so there's mm. kind of a lot of things that you may mix between cultures Ah, what about the butterfly in our PowerPoint? Well, it, it may show us some some prosperity next year or some, some new friends. New friends around the world. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Uh, wonderful. Okay, anybody else before we move forward? Oh, with yeah. our I would like We're to go, share one. Go for no, it. We, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, like in India, it's believed that you should avoid like sleeping under a people tree at night because like there are some superstitions that people believe that some kind of spirit will go into you and you will become a ghost. But like the real thing is that you shouldn't sleep because it gives out carbon dioxide and you can have health problems. So like I thought I could share this one with you. Do you mean like sleeping underneath like in a bunk bed? No, like under a tree, but like this specific tree that's called people tree. So oh. people believe that if you sleep, then you will have a spirit inside you and you'll become a ghost. <laughs> Maybe the spirit of the tree. But people believe that like spirits live in people trees. So like they'll come mm. into you, but it's like only because that the trees give out carbon dioxide at night. So you might have some health. Mm. What about, so does that translate also to like having plant life or trees in your home? Is that an okay thing? Um, I couldn't get you. Could you just repeat? Is it okay? Is it okay then to have plants or, or trees in your home? You can have, but it's like preferable not to sleep under it at night because just it's because it gives out carbon dioxide at night and then you can have lots of uh, mostly it's like respiratory problems but like it's you should not believe in this superstition because it's not real it's just mm -hmm. like people create their own concepts about this yeah it's a it's a great addition of information that sometimes within these superstitions or traditions uh within cultures people can add their own um their own fears or their own things to it. And then over oral um, um, tradition and talk and word of mouth and things being passed down from generation to generation, they all of a sudden become what you believe, right? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, Very interesting. Yeah, we, have, we have three other people. Um, Okay. Yeah, we have. So, um, if if you tell Maybe us, we in can this, take this two more, week. and then we yeah. can, um, depending on the time, we can always continue the discussion um, after. Want to take two more? For yeah, of course. Yeah, we have two more exactly. Okay. Super. So, um, Giovanna and Jasmine. First, let's have Giovanna. Okay. Thank you for unmuting. So I just want to comment how is incredible that this all this super key of these superstitions they are so old but they pursue over time in so many different cultures like 
even though we don't really believe in them, we end up doing those things because it is our culture, you know? And yeah. I doubt that there is anyone who knows someone who got lucky because of this things that they do, you know? So it's it's just incredible how this how culture works. Yeah, I agree. But Guy said, you know, finding out whether some of these things are true or not true takes away from um, the, the thought of it itself. So they'll continue. <laughs> Unless somebody says this isn't true, it's not happening. <laughs> we'll continue with our with our superstitions and traditions. Okay, there was someone else. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, for well, our last participation for this segment, Jasmine. Uh, hi. So I just want to say, um, like, I absolutely love this pro like this presentation. It's so different. So it's like unlike the other presentations about science. And man, I'm like mind blown because when you like talked about architecture, I was like, wait, hold on, how does that link? And then when you look back at it, and it's like, oh, most countries were like colonized by some country, right? Mm -hmm. And then most right. of those colonizers, they just left their print onto that country. So some some. Some people might agree that actually they left part of their culture there, right? And I think sharing this range of experiences shape your perspective. And the more you're exposed to more cultures, the more open you are to new ideas. It's like watching a movie in the eyes of like three different characters, which is, each have an alternative story of the same event, if that makes any sense. It makes complete sense. I love the analogy because you're kind of looking at, if you're looking at it almost from a bird's eye view, like you're watching all these um, these things happen and, and the discussion, it's exactly like that. It's, it's like multiple stories all happening at the same time. I can envision uh, somebody making a film about this <laughs> in the film thing that we're doing. And actually, yeah. thank you because I planned my next year's Eve. I'm going to have beans in my pocket, walk around with like suitcases, wear some yellow underwears and distribute them everywhere. And just, thank you. That was amazing. Absolutely. Okay. I love it. I love it. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wonderful and I like the way that what you said it kind of gatewayed into um, what we're talking about is that when we're open to these um, different cultures and different things with, with that happen it makes us it not only helps us learn about other cultures but it helps us learn about ourselves and our own culture right because um, it gives us a little, we're looking at it from a little bit of a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So we learn just as much about ourselves as we're learning about everyone else too. Um, not something that I noticed. And one of the things with that I think is going to be a critical skill mm -hmm. as we move um, into sort of what I think is like um, uh, new horizons of maybe our work platform, new horizons of our school platform, especially with the pandemic and everything that's happening now, it's kind of forced us to, to shift in understanding new ways of communicating, uh, new ways of working together. Um, because of all of this, we may have new career opportunities or jobs that we're not even aware of at this moment that haven't even quite been developed yet, but will be developed out of what is going on now and what is sort of our, our world that we're living in now. And I really truly believe uh, having our cultural understanding and cultural awareness is going to be one of those critical skills that we're going to need when we're connecting in global platforms you know, just, you know, just as we are today uh, here. So that's something to keep in mind um, that, you know, for success in our future, and this could be on different levels, whether it's establishing peace, whether it's establishing sustainable development, uh, whether it's um, uh, coming together to have different perspectives to uh, break new paradigms in science, or cultural understanding or the arts or whatever the discipline is, we have these aha moments and we have more of them when we have uh, different perspectives and, and a global team that brings different thoughts uh, together to the table. So I have a slide here that talks a little bit about that and how research has shown 
that diversity actually increases our creativity. Look at just from our conversation here. Um, I love the idea of creating a movie or, or how can we celebrate our cultural diversity or what can we create from that? Um, everyone has something to bring to the table, right? Everyone brings something. Um, so here again, we're talking about skills of success and um, the way that we're globally connected and the way that it, it interacts with our, our future. Having experiences and working with people in different cultural backgrounds, I think is so important. Um, there was somebody on the chat who used the word as international citizen or global citizenship. Even our paradigms that shift within our own language of how we talk about ourselves and in how we talk about um, um, us as a global economy. You know, I'm not necessarily just national, I'm international. Everyone here is international, right? I'm a global citizen. I'm not just a citizen of, of my own country or my own state. I'm actually a citizen of the world. So the way that we shift our paradigms and sometimes our language is really important. And you guys might see that older generations or your parents or grandparents might speak differently and have a whole different set of language than you do. Does anyone, uh, has anyone had any experience with this? I know for me, my parents spoke about, and my grandparents spoke very differently about the world um, than, than I learned to speak in school. So it's like we were almost speaking kind of two different languages when we were thinking about the world. Anybody else have any experience like that? Sergio. Sergio? You hear me? I can hear you, yes. Sergio. Yeah. Well, I think I think uh, the most important thing is that because of this technology or uh, all these advances on the economic, social, environmental, or technological aspect, it it has more than changed the language, created new languages or maybe new parts of the language. Because years ago, with our parents, we didn't have the the verb. WhatsApp someone. Yeah. Or or we didn't have the we didn't have the noun tweet, that type of thing. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think right. is more than more than a uh, new ones, it has changed and added different things. Absolutely, Sergio. So within everything that we're experiencing, uh the language has been changing. You the youth are the new language like that's that's what you encompass you are the new language that's that's emerging from all of this you are the ones that are developing creating all of this that's why i'm so passionate about um, hearing your voice and having your voice be part of the conversation your ideas is because um everything that it will become is everything that you are uh, right now and will be. And I think we all agree and something we all um, think about is it's very complex, right? We had our, our wheel, but we've added through our discussion so many different things to our wheel and, and it can be very complex culture, it can be a very complex thing. Um, uh, the next slide just talks more a little bit about more, more skills. I think we've talked about all of this. Um, you guys talked about being listeners. When we listen to other people's stories, when we listen to them, we have more empathy. We connect to them. Um, being respectful, uh, building self-awareness. We talked about how we learn more about ourselves sometimes when we're uh, engaged in other cultures. Does anybody have anything to add? Any stories, any eureka moments, anything that should be in this circle that's not? Uh, Shura? Sure, sure, sure yeah. um, yes, but yes, I uh, think. I have. Oh, wait, what? Uh, Go I ahead, see. please. Okay, Shura, sure. and then is it Suzette? Yes. Okay. 
Shura, why don't you go first and then? Yes. I think that I would add um, empathy in the in the will. I think it's a very valuable value. Uh, and yeah, you you have to have empathy with others, no matter their culture, no matter um, their backgrounds, just to understand them and put li like. As the as the saying says, uh, put yourself in the shoes of the other one. Empathy. Absolutely, yes. Put put your feet in the shoes of the other one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mrs. Heather. I think you're muted. Yeah. Um, so set, uh, you may continue. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I just want to add that we need to assume good intentions because we don't know uh, a lot about the other person. So we need to assume, assume that whatever he's doing, he's doing in a good way. So let's assume good intentions. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Suzette, where are you uh, visiting us from? Sorry? Hi there. Where are you visiting us from? What country? From Mozambique. Mozambique. Okay. Well, Mozambique is near South Africa. Yeah. Oh, thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you for sharing that insight. That's wonderful. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else before we move forward? Asimar has something to tell us. Okay. Okay, thank you. So uh, one of the skills that you had mentioned is to ask questions. And I really, really, really identify with that. Because uh, even when someone is saying something, all these wires in my head, they try to connect with each other. If in case they're not able to, or if in case they are not uh, like completely connecting, or there is a gap in between there, like I don't know the reason why something is happening, I really get very worried. So I go ahead and Google the stuff and then I find out more. And as and when I do that, I get I gain more knowledge. I can reason out things, I can form better solutions, I can form better connections, and then I can innovate new stuff using the learnings which I have. So I find that really, really interesting. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you for adding that. Uh, it's, it's always important to ask questions. Sometimes we're afraid to ask questions, but I think through that, um, you know, a lot of people usually want to answer your questions or explain stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. I think um, if I may add something, and this is like a message for the delegates that yes. um, on the on the topic of self-awareness, I think also like they they tell you like just to be yourself, but that just like gets in the way of you truly recognizing that being yourself is actually way complicated than you think. And we have your delegates that are developing and that they are getting to grow into their personality and become the people they are they are they are going to be for the rest of the life of their lives and change throughout throughout the process. So. I think that's something that is really, really important. I think that is super important. And I think that I think that that's true um, no matter where you are in life. I think um, we're constantly becoming the person that we are um, meant to be. It's sort of a, a, a continuum of energy there. Oh, that was that was wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Okay, I'm moving on to just the next slide and talking about, you know, Guy was mentioning about um, peace land and how everyone's going to be invited. We all play a crucial role in developing um, peace land and the, the world uh, leading peace building NGOs, uh, we went to them to ask the question about cultural diversity and how it's driving uh, uh, peace and development. And I put a few, you can read them on the slide if you wish here. Um, I don't want to read them uh, word for word with you, 
but you can look at the Institute for Justice um, uh, there who said, I believe really listening to one another's story has potential to open eyes. I know you all here with me have truly opened my eyes um, in so many ways with your stories, um, with your experiences, with all the talent that I've seen here. Um, and somebody had mentioned it in our, in our circle here that we're chatting about each one of us has a story, each one of us has a color to add to that um, tapestry. Um, in the Alliance for Peace Building, they said with ample evidence of diverse groups produce better results so we can aim higher. Um, I love the quote by Gandhi, if we could change the world ourselves, the tendencies in the world would also change. Um, and one of our visitors on our roundtable talked about peace within. So that peace within is developed so that we can have peace without, and both are important components of that. And Generations for Peace Institute uh, talk about providing a platform where people can express uh, different cultures and ways of being. Um, we have, who was it, Mariana on, our dancer. Um, and I know you have shared your experiences of um, expressing yourself and your culture through dance. And many of you, uh, maybe you play an instrument. Um, um, maybe you guys have some other examples of things that you do uh, that express your, express your culture. Besides running around the Christmas tree or running around with suitcases <laughs> around the Christmas tree. Anybody have a hand up of, of other ways that you may uh, express your culture? Similar to maybe dance or... Hi. Ah, oh, Gabby. Yes, hi. I think a way to express your culture is like gastro uh, the gastronomy, like cooking. You know what I mean? Oh, through food and cooking. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Like, Absolutely. like in Peru, we have a lot of uh, plates like ceviche, papua longaina, uh, I don't know, ajira, lina, that are, are a way that we spend time. We, we also have a thing called, uh, ¿cómo se llama eso que comemos? Eh, la tierra. Pachamanca. <laughs> have a thing called Pachamanca that is made in the earth. And it has a whole ceremonial process. And that's a way we engage with our culture and we have, we like um, our nature because the Pachamama is the mm -hmm. god of the earth. So oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. I love that through food. And so do you have often have big gatherings for meals or is it um, traditionally just you cook for your family? Yeah, it, it's it's like a whole gathering, yeah. like a party. You know what I mean? When we eat those kind of foods, like we, we must together and share our time and spend a good. I don't yeah. know. It's a ritual. <laughs> I love it. So food is definitely one way we culturally express ourselves. Absolutely. Any other hands up here? Let's see who we have. Uh, music, I see music from Marissa. Marissa, are you on? Unmuted, you could share more about this. Yeah. Um, hello. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I haven't talked yet, but now I'm <laughs> There's always a first. You're welcome here. <laughs> Yeah, I think music because it gives life to the culture. Like you can express yourself and the type of things you like through through music. Like that. Absolutely. So different music and and movement, you know, movement as well. Anybody else have an unmute? Um we have uh, Alejandro okay uh, like a very, a very good one that I like uh, is like language and accents for me oh. I, I don't know I really love language so for example mm -hmm. I speak Spanish 
but for example, the Spanish in Colombia is not the same as the Spanish in Mexico, and not even in, in, in Colombia is the same. For example, I'm Paisa, so I have a very distinctive accent, uh, as you know, the American accent and the accent in yeah. different states of the US. So, and we also use different words, different expressions. So for me, it's like a really interesting way to express mm -hmm. my culture. I love my accent and I love like the expressions we use. And I think that everyone should like keep on using them because it's mm -hmm. like really something really interesting. And also about um, um, different slangs, you know, different, I like that you, oh, we have another speaker that's going to be coming on soon. So um, I'll keep mindful of the time. But Alejandro, you're right. The way that we speak, some of our mannerisms, even our accent could define those things. Um, the reinfo reinforcing cultural diversity is definitely a driving factor in peace development. And that's why I put up these slides to talk about you as um, peacemakers, as part of this um, global community that we have. If we could take away one thing from our discussion today, besides all the amazing things that I learned from you, and I want to um, sincerely give my heartfelt thanks for joining, for being brave to unmute your mic, um, uh, and to be with uh, me today here, um, is that we don't always see things the way that they are. We see them as we are. So if we can keep that in mind, then when we have these new experiences, it's, it's up to us to kind of step outside of ourselves, step inside someone else's shoes, as was mentioned in our group, to really uh, have cultural empathy, cultural understanding, and, um, and connect globally to one another. Um, and I just want to say thank all of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing yourself here and for sharing all your stories. You guys each make up a piece of this fabric, right? You all have something to share. And I'm really looking forward to getting to know each of you uh, even more. And thank you for being part of the IMUN this year. And, um, and thank you for being part of Peaceland. I want to say love and peace to all of you. Thank you, Guy, for having me. Um, thank and you very much, Ms. 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 Heather. Um, I am Youth Ambassador for UNESCO Center for Peace, and it was an honor having you. Uh, back uh, in in our model, and we're we're very happy for you to share these experiences with our delegates and do a um, a chat that we didn't have in all of the summer programs so far. So thank you very much. Oh, it's my well, pleasure, and you. just uh, congratulations to all Rodrigo, of our participants and winners. Mm -hmm. uh, what's that, Guy? Yeah, just one second, Rodrigo. Yeah. Okay, free the screen. Okay. Yes. Okay. So thank you so much, Heather. You know, I for for knowing for so long, I am I wasn't expecting anything less. So I want to just thank you one more time for bringing that diversity uh, in. And then this is the <gasps> citation that, uh, of course, uh, by the for the Senate, the, the oh Maryland uh, General Assembly has written a, a citation to thank you for your contributions today, okay? So now I uh, sent you the link. Uh, thank you, I really, thank you, and I will be meeting you in the, in the studio room for the interview. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, Guy. It's okay. very much a pleasure. Yes. Okay. Guy, I'm telling you about to you, Guy. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, you have bye -bye. next speaker is, uh, um, is ready, waiting for you. Thank you, and I, I'll be back soon. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. See you in a moment. Okay. Hi, Adeli. Uh, so, yeah, guys, no. this is another conference. Uh, Rodrigo. Yeah, thank you, Rodrigo. I'm here. So, uh, hello, guys. Uh, we're going to have with us uh, Amy Kuroto, um, she's an squad attorney at Merlin Law Group, PA. Uh, actually, attorney Amy Kuroto began her career working in the halls of the United States Congress in Washington, D.C. Uh, while working on the Hill, Amy honed her advocacy and diplomacy skills while working to help uh, support congressional staff of matters of uh, foreign policy and finance. Amy graduated from uh, University District of Columbia School of Law 
where she served as president of the UDC Law Mock Trial Team, president of the UDC Law International Negotiations Team, and president of the International Law Society. So, uh, Amy, welcome. Could you hear us? I can, yes, I can hear you. Perfect. So, go ahead. Okay, wonderful. I firstly wanted to thank um, Mr. Jokin and UNESCO Center for Peace for having me here today. Um, anytime I get to talk about Model UN, I jump at the opportunity because it's been such a life-changing experience for me and it's very close to my heart. Um, so I'll just jump in. Model United Nations is a training ground for future lawyers, politicians, global leaders, and change makers. The title of the speech is How Model UN Can Take You to Unexpected Places. For me, Growing up, I never knew I was going to be a lawyer or that I would even have the chance to travel internationally or work at places like the World Bank, United States Congress, or even at a top national law firm. Model UN opened those doors for me and they opened doors that I didn't even know existed. Model UN became a platform for which launched my legal career and my legal career started actually here at UNESCO Center for Peace, doing exactly what you are all doing here today. I was a Model UNer and I specifically staffed here at UNESCO Center for Peace. So I'm really excited to be back. It's been a few years, but it's awesome. I was listening to some of the conversations um, for the past hour that you guys are having and it was really inspiring. Most of, most of the people in college join sororities and fraternities, but I joined Model UN. And for me, it's made all the difference in my life. And I didn't just join Model UN, I was actually pretty obsessed with Model UN. UN. I don't know if any of you guys relate to that here. I was the kind of Model UN kid that made like Model UN memes with Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and I would use like the regular Model UN slang in my everyday life such as like decorum, delegates, and point of order. And I could physically feel all my non-Model UN friends who I like actually referred to as muggles, Harry Potter mm -hmm. reference, um, get annoyed when I would talk about Model UN so much. But I didn't even care because I loved the program so much and it became my entire life. What I love about Model UN is that I think it teaches you things that you'll never be able to learn in another classroom setting. Like, where are you going to learn how to give a speech to a hundred strangers about the importance of nuclear disarmament while trying to control your sweating palms and your nerves as you mentally count the amount of times that you say, um, between each sentence? Surely not a math class, right? <laughs> Model UN teaches you skills such as negotiation, critical thinking, and public speaking in a very trial by fire way. And I think there's literally no better way to learn that than by actually going out and doing these things, which Model UN forces you to do. Model UN takes you to unexpected places, and it can also take you to anywhere you really want to go. The skills you learn at Model UN are indispensable, advocacy being one of the most important. Whether you are just a first-time Model UNer or you're a seasoned professional Model UNer here for your 13th Model UN conferences, conference advocacy and being able to advocate for yourself and others is a vital life skill that will help you thrive in any profession whatsoever and in your personal life as well. No matter what career path you take, whether you end up becoming a politician or a doctor or an engineer, um, I think advocating for yourself and the people that you care about is a skill that will take you throughout life. In the process of learning how to advocate for my member state's position when I was in Model UN, I fell in love with the process of bringing people together to write a resolution. And these are usually people, as you all know, that share different views than yourself. Um, and you're brought together ultimately to find a way to share and solve these global issues. And I think that this skill is what humanity needs the most right now, more than ever, especially everything that's going, out, going on in the world. So I think that you're all in the perfect place to be able to hone those skills and make a change within the world. My love for Model UN, negotiation, public speaking, and advocacy led me to law school. I wanted to do Model UN, but in real life. So the skills I learned in Model UN actually helped me stand out above my peers in law school. I remember being astounded by the majority of my classmates who had never, ever spoken in public before, and they were actually really terrified of speaking. I will note that I was terrified of speaking in public before I did Model UN, but since I was forced to speak so many times in public because of Model UN, I got better at it as time went on. I don't know if someone's speaking or <laughs> if I continue. Nevertheless, I did outshine my peers in law school during oral arguments and debates and mock trial competitions due to my Model UN experience. Model UN also helped me land jobs. Ever since I did Model UN, there hasn't been one interview that I went into where Model UN was not brought up. I think that this is a very powerful tool of experience that you all have in your pockets to bring up in any interview you have going forward. 
I remember working um, at the United States Congress and during my interview, I was interviewed by the chief of staff for a congressman. And um, when I was interviewing, I figured out that he was a former Model UNer and we instantly bonded off of our Model UN experience. We started talking about all the different conferences that we went to. I feel like that this absolutely led me to getting the job because I was able to have a similar experience with him and he knows my background from Model UN. I also remember specifically sitting in the Comey hearing um, in the Senate when I was working on the Hill and I had someone shout from the back from behind me, Morocco, which is the member state that I represented during Edmund in 2014 at the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons Committee. Whew, that's a mouthful. <laughs> but the people that you meet within Model UN at this conference, one that you're attending today and that you're speaking to, you guys are really the people that will go on and work in these spaces and are the people that will go on to become the next leaders and lawyers and politicians and diplomats and global leaders throughout the world. Another way Model UN has helped me during my career um, was my time working at the World Bank. I was probably the only American on my team who didn't have an advanced law degree in international arbitration or diplomacy at the time. Nevertheless, I feel like I was able to keep up at the World Bank because of my Model UN experience. I already knew how to draft write and how to draft resolutions, and we were writing resolutions like first day on the job. And I couldn't help but think, oh my gosh, if I had not done Model UN, how would I be able to write these resolutions on the fly? I don't know how any of the other students were able to, or the other interns were able to, but I knew just from Model UN. Um, the Model UN also helped me be able to navigate in, 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 in a room where people come from all over the country. The World Bank is one of those experiences. It's an amazing, amazing place to work because everyone is from all over the globe and you come into contact with people from different cultural experiences. And Model UN really helped me navigate working at the bank. I still use a lot of my Model UN experience um, today that I was taught at through, through working at the law firm. I use my negotiation skills I learned in Model UN, my public speaking, my public speaking and my advocacy skills are still things I use every single day when I go to trial or mediation. Model UN helped me launch an entire career and it gave me the chance to travel internationally and see people and meet people I would have never met but for Model UN. Above all, Model UN has brought me some of my closest friends the friends I made in Model UN are still the strongest friendships I have today. They're the friends I saw later on in life after Model UN conferences. I saw them at mock trial competitions while in law school, on the Hill, at international law conventions, and are the friends I still have now that I visit all around the country um, prior to the COVID um, issue. But there's they're, they're still people I FaceTime every single day now. We Skype and we talk and... Um, whenever we do talk, we just reminisce, reminisce about the time that we spent within committee together and we talk and we laugh. Um, if you go through my cell phone to this day, I still have the people's names as the member states that they represented in my phone. So for those of you that are joining Model UN for your very first time, welcome. You've really stumbled upon something special, especially here at UNESCO Center for Peace. Um, to the seasoned professional Model UNer out there who lives for committee, welcome back. I'm one of you. <laughs> Model UN can really take you wherever you want to go in life. It has made all the difference in mine. I wouldn't be who I am today without it. Questions? So uh, people, does anyone have any question for Amy? So I have um, one. Okay, perfect, go ahead. Uh, Amy, thank you for your experience and everything you've told us. Uh, where did you go to law school? Sorry if I didn't catch it. Yeah, I went to law school in Washington, D.C. at the University District of Columbia. Ah, okay, thank you. Perfect. Does anyone have any other question? No, so... Um, yeah, Giovanna. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? I just want to ask, what is your major advice for all of us who are participating now? I think my major advice would be to soak in the experiences and the people that you're talking to right now. Um, like I had mentioned and cited, the people that you are speaking to right now, it's insane. Um, I didn't realize it when I was doing conferences, but it really ended, they really ended up all becoming people 
who are running the world and the country now. So I think that this is a great networking tool that you all have. And I would take this time to really um, network among yourselves and um, at each other on socials and always stay in touch because I think it can have a huge impact on your career, especially when you're in spaces of networking and getting jobs. Um, and then also just moving within your career. Thank you, Amy. Uh, please, uh, Sergio, go ahead. Hey, hello, my name is Sergio. I'm from Colombia. And in my city, I am the leader of a group of people that have been participating in this type of uh, events from approximately 10 years. I've been participating on, this is my 30th model. So I've been, I've been on different experiences. And I would last, uh, like to ask you if apart from changing your life, apart from uh, making you a uh, leader and these type of things, do you also think it helps, like United Nations models, help to build better, apart from people, better societies? I think it does. I think that people who participate in Model United Nations um, have more awareness of what's going on in the world and also empathy. I think that when you do Model United Nations and you step into the shoes of a diplomat, right, you're learning empathy and how this country views um, different global issues, even if it's not an issue that you necessarily agree with. So I do think that Model UN builds better citizens and those citizens go out and they change their societies and their cities and their environments. So yes. Thank you, Amy. Uh, does anyone have any other question? Mm, okay, um, as anyone has any other question, I actually have one. Uh, and is that uh, in many cases, younger delegates are assigned like to delegations that do not have like a deep uh, participation or a main role in a committee because of the topic and yeah, because of the topic uh, principally. And uh, in many cases, this uh, make them quit from MEM because they create like a wrong side of, uh, of it because of their experience. That happens uh, uh, too much in Colombia. So um, I'm Colombian too, just for you to know. Uh, so uh, what's your like your main advice for those people? For the people who come into a committee and they don't have that great of an experience because of the topic, maybe, or I think my, uh, my advice would be keep trying. I know that sometimes um, different experiences, I think in life in general can be discouraging, but Model UN is such a great experience. Even if you, even if maybe you're not enjoying the experience this one time, you are learning great public speaking, advocacy, writing skills and you're meeting a net worth of people, um, I would say give it another shot. Sometimes conferences, some conferences aren't as good as other conferences, right? Um, I've been to a number of conferences I hated, but if you go to enough of them, you'll, I think it's, um, you'll, you'll love it. <laughs> thank you. Please, Simar, go ahead. Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, so I had a question that, how can we rock every month we attend? I'm sorry, you went out. Could you repeat that again? Um, sure. So how can we rock every month that we attend? How can we do our best whenever we are attending a month? That's an awesome question. Um, ways to rock a Model UN conference. Um, so I think preparation is the best advice ever. Um, I, there have been times I've gone into a Model UN conference and I wasn't prepared. And I think I, I think I represented China during um, a conference and I wasn't prepared at all. And I said a lot of things that China wouldn't say and didn't win any awards because of that. So preparation is definitely key. Um, and then also, I think when I see people win awards in Model UN and I see them have a great time, it's because um, they're not being adversarial because I think People sometimes get aggressive because they want to win awards and they want to be the best delegate. But I feel like the way to rock a Model UN conference is to go out of your way to work with people and um, be kind to one another and really like listen to the other person's opinion on their member state or country. It makes them feel seen and it makes people want to work with you more. And the more people that want to work with you and the more people that you have writing onto your resolution, right, it's more likely to pass. So I think being, work, being being very prepared and being easy to work with can help you rock a model, model United Nations conference. 
Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. So uh, please, Alejandro, tell us. Thank you. Sorry. Second question. Like, do you have like a tip for when you get like a, I don't know, like, I don't want to say attack, but like a comment from another delegation or, you know, or participant or like a question that, I don't know, it caught you like off guard. You don't know anything about it, like a good tip to how to improvise and like keep your uh, position and your, uh, yeah, your posture. Yeah, um, if a comment ca catches me off guard, I mean, I think it would depend on the comment, but maybe in the past, I've tried to switch it back at them in some way and steer the conversation in a different way. I see a lot of people do that when they um, when they are faced with something that they don't understand, like a question that they didn't prepare for. Um, and you see politicians do it a lot in their speeches as well, is that you steer the, com you steer the conversation or maybe even change the topic. Um, <laughs> that that's something that I've done in the past before um or I mean it, you can be very upfront about it you can say I don't understand the question or could you please explain um I don't think that there's anything wrong with saying I don't know you're not really expected to know every single answer right um no one does not even real diplomats that go out there they don't know the the answer to everything but I think that you can take the moment to listen to what they're trying to ask you and see um if you can learn about it in that moment and move forward. Uh, perfect. Okay, so uh, now we'll go to, with Namia, please. Yeah, I have a question. Like if someone counter questions you and you're speaking something and for example, you're not getting what to speak as an answer. So like what can we think to say at that time so that like we don't have to say that I will answer it later on. So how can we cover that up by saying something which can be taken as an answer by the other person's question? Um, okay, I think that's a good question. So you're basically saying you're not getting the answer that you want out of that person? Yes. Hard. Yeah. Um, how would I handle a situation? If I'm not getting the answer I want out of them, I think you have two options. You can um, have patience and um, let them know that you're really trying to work with them. And if we could sit down and like talk about this, and I'm just trying to understand your viewpoint, and this is why I'm trying to understand from you. Um, I think letting people know that you are interested in their point of view and that you're not trying to be adversarial or combative can be a very easy way to kind of um, disarm somebody, right? Um, and just letting them know that you are interested in their point of view can sometimes help. Um, if it seems like they're very adversarial and they just want to fight, then I would probably move on because um, I wouldn't want to waste um, committee time dealing with someone who's probably not going to work with me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for your uh, question. So, uh, Simar, do you have another question? Because you, you have your hand raised. No? Okay. So, perfect. Uh, does anyone have another question for Amy? No one? Or uh, you, Amy, want to tell us, uh, I don't know, perhaps uh, more things about your CV, about your career, uh, how it was to study law in, in, in Colombia? Yeah, um, studying law in D.C. was really awesome. And it's an incredible experience because you're right there in the middle of politics. I was um, studying law kind of between the shift of the Obama presidency and the Trump presidency. So there was a lot going on, to say the least. And I was working on the Hill during the shift of power. Um, so if you ever get the opportunity to, I, don't, I don't know how many people here who are interested in studying law, but if you ever have any questions, you can ask Mr. Jokin for my information. I'm more than happy to ask, answer any questions about law. I tutor a lot of people um, getting into law school and taking the bar exam. So I would love to pass out that information. Oh, that's right. Thank you. So uh, Alejandro, please, we have a question. Sorry, I'm doing so many questions. Uh, like... What are like kind of your like ambitions, if I may ask, because I know and I really love like the DC culture of the hill. Like I like I've, I've watched like all TV shows related to, you know, like politics, everything. I love law school. I was thinking I was studying, you know, law in the United States. So maybe uh, like how has your like what you've done? I don't know. 
uh, like help you to what you want to do, not what you're doing now, but maybe what you want to do. Yeah. Um, I think pursuing law is a wonderful, wonderful option. I would always encourage anyone I meet because so many great things can come to your life through deciding to become a lawyer. It really is a tool and it's a powerful tool. Um, you can help a lot of people, including your family and um, different causes that you're very passionate about. Working on the Hill was an amazing experience. It, it was somewhat like some of the TV shows, but even better in real life. There's a lot of history and um, there's a lot of politics. And it's something I would encourage you to pursue if you're interested in working on the Hill one day. Um, as far as my career ambition, ambitions, I was recently barred as an attorney only a few months ago. I just graduated law school, actually. And right now I'm working as a trial attorney at a top national firm. So a trial attorney is kind of the ones that you see on the TV in the courtroom doing all the action and objecting. It reminds me a lot of Model UN, which is why I loved it. And I was drawn to it in law school. And I just wanted to, um, as far as my ambitions go, I think just to be a great trial attorney. I think I'm going to work in trial for a few years um, and gain a national repu reputation in addition to an international reputation. And um, I see myself eventually getting straight back into the international sector, possibly at the United Nations. So I, I have it kind of in my back pocket of things that I want to do. I was working at the UN, but we'll see. Um, if you decide to get a law degree, any of you, you'll see that the world is kind of open to you with a law degree and you can decide to do a million different things. So especially as younger people, um, you, you have a lot of options and I think that you should weigh those options and see what comes to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, please, Thanej, uh, could you please open your microphone and do the question? Um, this is this is like a technical like a uh, um question like what to take in this um what what do you think of qualified immunity and do you think that it's actually a valid cause to end it? Yeah, that's my question. Huh? If it's a qualified, should we end um qualified immunity? Is that what you're saying, right? Yeah, I, I came across it as I was watching this this video. Uh, I came across it as I was watching this random video about um, some U.S. laws which were like protecting police officers. So, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, okay, like the right. So from my understanding, so and you can correct me because I um, do a different type of law, but qualified immunity is basically the right to be free from excessive police force, right? Um, so my opinion on that is I don't think that we should get rid of it. I think that it's great that we have it within our system to be protected by police officers, but also be protected by excessive force. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, please, Nanya. Um, yeah, I just have one more question that what if someone is already a bit experienced and like if you have the option of choosing which committee you would be like debating for in which committee you will be. So according to you, which one would you choose? Oh, which one would I choose? Which is my like my, my favorite committee essentially? Like which one is better according to your choice? Oh, I don't think any committee is better than any other because I think as um, when I was doing Model UN, I actually tried to get in every committee. I tried to do as many as possible. Each one, each um, conference, I did try to do different ones because you're learning so many different things. I feel like if you just did GA over and over and over, you would kind of go through all the same GA topics versus going from GA and UNEP and then um, UNCTAD. In that way, you're able to kind of get in depth about more different issues. And I think that's like the awesome part of Model UN is you're really learning about a lot of different global issues that you don't really get to address that much in school or your day-to-day -day life. So I would encourage people to do as many different committees as possible. But I think the committee I liked the most being part of is GA because I like the bigger committees. Um, there's just more fun because you're meeting more people and you're debating more people and you get to make more friends. Thank you. 
Okay, perfect. So now we'll go with Victor, Victor Caldeira. Yeah, hi, I'm Victor. I'm from Brazil. And throughout this week, we've have uh, heard about becoming a leader. Uh, I want to know what do you think a leader, like the, character, the characteristics a leader uh, should have and how can we become a leader for our community? Mm -hmm. That's an awesome question. I believe characteristics of a leader um, is the ability to listen. I think that's probably one of the most important things. Um, people want to feel seen and heard and listened to. And I think that you're more able to lead effectively and draw people in as a leader if you listen to people. Um, I think there are a lot of different issues, um, not only in the United States where I live, but across the world where we have people in power who are not listening to um, their communities and what their country wants. So I think that would be the number one thing for a leader, his ability to listen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, hello, Mr. Guy. Hello. Hi, Guy. <laughs> hello. Finally. <laughs> yeah, any more questions for Amy? Okay. Amy, uh, thank you very much for agreeing to, to be here. There were some coordination issues uh, because I didn't even realize we were in already. And uh, uh, was going, but we are happy to have you here. Plus, uh, after this, if you have some time, we are going to have an interview also. Uh, we have a studio where every speaker will go there and ask some few questions. But the one thing I wanted to, to share with, um, with, the, the, with the delegate is the fact that uh, you are also part of UNESCO Center for Peace, right? You are alum. Yeah? I, I want am you to alum. Yeah, I want you to share the year when you were working as a part of this family and how, that, how did that help you? How did that impact you, you know, to help you get where you are today? Yeah, um, so I actually interned for UNESCO Center for Peace about the year before going into law school. So I was in that law school application process when I was interning for UNESCO Center for Peace. And I think um, the idea of going to law school is very intimidating, especially when you're in the application process. But through UNESCO Center for Peace, I also met a lot of other people who were in the same situation as me and also applied to law school. So it gave me a network of people that I felt like were going through the same thing as me and gave me the courage to move forward with wanting to become a lawyer. Um, UNESCO Center for Peace also, when we were doing, I was doing the same thing that you guys are, I would be listening to diplomats that she would bring in and different lawyers and change makers and listening to them talk and their career kind of made me think about what I wanted my career to look like. So I feel like UNESCO Center for Peace kind of put in my head what I wanted my career to look like and where I wanted to go in the world. And I think that this is an incredible program. I'm very glad I did it. I feel like maybe I wouldn't have been a lawyer and maybe I wouldn't have been able to work in these international spaces if not but for UNESCO Center for Peace. Okay, thank you so much. And I think this is very important for all of them listening right now, not just the delegate, but also the facilitators, because uh, there's not, you know, since the beginning of this conference, a lot have been said about collaboration, cooperation, working together. Even we had someone from NASA this morning, he was talking, you know, imagine taking that trip. To, he's actually in charge of this, uh, sending this, uh, the next uh, shuttle to Mars, you know. Uh, yeah. And then he's here telling them what is more important is not the science, not knowledge, it's a collaboration, cooperation, working together. I think that was a very powerful message that you are reiterating also here. And the, the next thing I also want you to say, okay, we are thinking, uh, I know you are very busy as a lawyer, uh, but we are also thinking uh, in the, because we are, we are going to be doing a lot of things online right now, about setting up a, uh, a, a, a mock trial team as part of the, as we expand, because we've been doing that through the school around the world. And uh, first of all, some of people here don't know what's a mock trial. I know you've done it as a trial, as at Adonai, you know exactly what it is. And I just want you before, uh, uh, you know, hopefully you can make yourself available to be helping us, but also to tell people here what the mock trial is and how uh, it can complement some of the things that the model UN is, is bringing to the table. Absolutely. Um, I was telling the students that I feel like Model UN has helped me so much as a lawyer, as a trial lawyer. Um, mock trial is basically kind of like Model UN in the idea that it's a simulation of the actual trial. 
So you'll have um, an, a, a plaintiff and a defendant, right? And it's basically two attorneys. So when you go into mock trial, you'll take the role of a lawyer and you'll be given a position, um, a client that you have, and you'll have to advocate for that client. Hello? Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> or you'll okay. be given. Oh, there we go. Sorry. No, now you're back. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have, so, so you're stepping basically into a lawyer's shoes in trial and you're going into trial and you're advocating for your client. So it's, it's very actually similar to Model UN, except there are different procedural rules. And I think that it can be a little more aggressive than um, Model UN. Model UN is a bit more about diplomacy and uh, mock trial is kind of like a battle of the wit. So yes. you have to win. You're, you have to you're win. going to have to win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in it to win it. So I think mock trial is a lot of fun um, because of the winning component. If you're competitive and you're interested in law, you don't have to want to be a lawyer. But I think if you're interested in law, it's an amazing opportunity as well. And it will get you on your feet pretty fast. Okay, Nanda, you stated that can we count on you to, uh, to find time on your schedule so that, uh, you know, to put a team in place? If some of the, the, the team member are volunteer to work in that field, are you willing to... To find it, I know the will is there, but said, are you able to find the time in, to help us put a team, a mock team, a, a, a mock trial team in the at US at UNESCO Center for Peace? Absolutely, I would love to do a mock trial team with you guys. Okay, well, that's I wanted us to finish uh, in those terms. I want to thank you very much. Yes, please let get your has certificate again back to you know, on the on the screen, uh, Rodrigo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you know. Uh, the headquarters of UNESCO Center for Peace is in Maryland, and we have all elected officials, like I said, from the city hall all the way to the state the assembly, the governor's mansion, everybody, we all, they are 100% behind this project. And they've actually, the senator uh, in the region actually signed a citation to say thank you to you. And that's what uh, I wanted uh, uh, Rodrigo to show again one more time. Mm -hmm. So that we could, okay, that's, mm. okay, so that is your official citation from the, from the Senate, uh, Maryland State Senate, uh -huh. so presented yeah. to you on this day, and I want, as a token of appreciation for your commitment, thank you very much, you. no, this is, this is headers. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, eh? <laughs> no, I want to see the one for Amy. Amy is copy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So sorry, G. Uh, give me one second. I'm having bad internet problems. Oh, I can't see that yet. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Because the internet literally right now is like so bad. It's like it's oh. not it's not charging. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay. You got it. You got it. <laughs> is it there? Yeah. Oh, thank God. Thank you. Thank I'm so you. sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Finally, we got the correct one. Okay, Amy. <laughs> so this is your official citation from the Senate. Okay, Maryland State Senate. So Again, thank you very much for your time. And I'll be sending, uh, I'll send you the link right now uh, to join us in the studio mm -hmm. for the, an interview, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. I don't know if there's any last word you want to say to the delegate and to the facilitators. Uh. Um, just enjoy your time here at UNESCO Center Pete for Peace. This is, you're in a great spot um, and really soak it up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank okay, you. bye. Goodbye. Rodrigo, you have the floor, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank See you. you. Okay. okay, dear delegates, we just finished with our schedule for today. So we're going to see each other tomorrow, the same time, 7 a.m. Uh, Washington, D.C. time for a start with our, with our schedule, okay? So have a nice, well, for me, it's a, an afternoon. Maybe, for, maybe for, for some of you guys, it's night already, so have a nice day, a, a nice afternoon, a nice, a good night, and we see 
each other tomorrow. Okay, guys? Thank Bye. you, Rodrigo. Bye, Chirabe. Thank Bye. you for attending today. Thanks. And sir. remember to study well and to prepare your position papers, delegate. Delegate. Yes, that's true. Remember when you position paper. Yeah.